forget to moot everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, this meeting of the Community and Corporate Organisation Policy and Scrutiny Panel. You might ref uh, hear some of us refer to it as COCO uh, during the meeting. Um, we've actually got a relatively short agenda today, but there are a couple of meaty, quite quite chunky items that I'm sure we'll be able to get our teeth into later. So it won't necessarily be a um, a short meeting as it might look if you if you read some of the reports. So I'd like to welcome members, um, particularly Councillor Hugh James, uh, who's joined uh, this panel. Welcome, Hugh. You're very welcome. Thank you. um, Hugh, I think you've replaced Councillor Wendy Griggs. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so well, welcome to you. Welcome to everyone. Welcome to officers. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. Thanks for your participation. We've got uh, we've also got Councillor Bridget Petty, the exec member with us. Uh, thank you, Bridget. And um, I'll ask officers, I think, to take the roll call of the minute. Just some, you know, the usual housekeeping and procedural matters that I think we're pretty much all used to by now. But this is the third I think this is our third virtual panel meeting, um, COCO panel meeting held under the virtual meetings regulations. So we're using Microsoft Teams, Microsoft Teams software. The proceedings will have, will have the same standing and validity as if they'd taken place at a physical meeting in the, in the town hall. So today's meeting has been streamed live on uh, YouTube. Um, for members of the public and other members who might be following proceedings. A recorded version will be available to view on the North Cam Somerset Council website within within 48 hours. I'd like to refer councillors as usual to the to the meeting etiquette. That is that is really important. Uh, we've all got copies of that. Please um, ensure your audio is muted if you're not speaking because we we, we that does obviously uh, cause some feedback for some or all of us so please uh, please stay on mute uh, and uh, and turn off any mobile phones please that you might have in the background councillors if you wish to speak if you could uh, do so by indicating you wish to do uh, wish to speak in the using the chat function that would be very helpful i know one or two possibly would normally put their hands up i think councillor lay morgan john you normally put your hand up don't you so we'll, we'll look out for that um i will try and keep um i'll try and call you in the order that i see you appearing in the in in, in the chat but um apologies in advance if i if i if the order if i get the order slightly wrong and make sure you're all called um i think it's important too for for panel members if we keep our uh videos on so that members of the public can can see our faces i think that that is important for a meeting uh, like this a any questions don't think of any questions uh philippa can i invite you please to take um or, or michelle take the roll call please yeah sorry for the silence michelle's got the list if she was going to do that Oh, yes. Um, OK, so I'll call your names in alphabetical order. Um, Councillor Bridger. Present. Uh, Councillor Butte. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Cato. Present. Uh, Councillor Clayton. He's not there, is he? Uh, Councillor Crewe. Here. Councillor Crosby. No. Um, Councillor James. Here. Councillor Lay Morgan. Present. Councillor McQuillan, he sent apologies. Uh, Councillor Payne. Uh, yes, present. Councillor Porter. Present. And Councillor Tradeaway. Present. Thank you. Thanks. Lovely. And we've had apologies from Councillor McQuillan. You're on mute, Councillor Bridger. Thank you, Philippa. Um, thanks, Michelle, for that. Yeah, I'll just, I was just saying that um, I'll invite officers to introduce themselves, I think, as we go through the agenda against the appropriate item. 
Uh, talking of which, I wanted to um, just make a change to the agenda. I wanted to move up the agenda. Item eight, which is the Winter Gardens Community Board um, annual report and update. That's that's item eight. I wanted to to bring that forward. So we look at that as the first sort of substantive item of, if you like. So that we'll take that um, before. We look at the green infrastructure strategy. I think that would help me and help um, officers uh, with uh, managing managing the the, uh, the meeting. Um, given that that's a change to the printed to the you know, to the published agenda, I think I need to sort of formally sort of move that. I don't think we need a vote, but if anyone objects uh, to us uh, changing the uh, changing the order slightly, um, perhaps if you would. Um, shake your head or indicate can't see anyone doing that so i'll take that as read so we'll take uh the winter gardens report as, as effectively item item six then after the um the first few items so item one on the agenda is addresses by members of the public michelle i don't think we have any do we no we haven't received any chairman Thank you. Item two, apologies for absence, notification of substitutes. Um, so it's Councillor Stuart McQuillan has given his apologies. Any other submitted apologies, um, Michelle? No other apologies, Chairman. Or notification of substitutes? Or notification of substitutes, no, Chairman. Noted, thank you. Item three, declaration of disclosable pecuniary interests. Good old standing order number 37. Uh, any declarations of disclosable pecuniary interests? Can't no, see any. No. Thank you. Minutes of the last meeting. So our last full panel meeting was the 12th of November last year. We need to approve those as a correct record, at least those of us who were present at, at that meeting. Um, I've I've had a good look at these. Um, and they've been published, obviously, as, as as draft minutes. Any any questions? Any comments? Points of clarification from members on those minutes? I don't think so. So I'll move those as um. We'll take those as a correct record, unless I don't think we need to vote on that, do we? Again, no one's indicated they um not happy with the minutes, so we'll take those as read. Uh, matters referred by uh, council, executive and other committees and panels. I, there were a few things very briefly I wanted to mention here. Um, the first of which was the fact that I intend to um, take a report to full council on the 20th of April from uh, from from this scrutiny panel. We've been doing a lot of a lot of work, a lot of work behind the scenes, actually, in all sorts of working groups and, and, and focus small focused areas of work we've been looking at in quite some detail. So I think um, particularly waste, obviously, with the um, launch of the new uh, LACCO from the 27th of March. So I intend to take a report to, to Council on the 20th of April, just, just to flag that. Um, Councillor Caritas Charles asked a question at Council in January about um, local democracy and community engagement just wanted to flag that i've written a response um myself um sue effort has a copy of that response she will be submitting sort of circulating that to all members i think she's just waiting for uh responses from a couple of other um from some couple of exec members before she she does so so that's not been forgotten uh and those responses will be circulated I'm mindful too that in the the council meeting last week was it last week? So I, I lose the track. I lose the track of time. Uh, I think it was last week. Um, Councillor Willis and Councillor Westbird, in reporting back from the police and crime panel, uh, we had a little bit of a discussion around um, what we might term fair funding, uh, or reassuring ourselves that we have fair funding for North Somerset in terms of. Um, the policing budget. Uh, I think Roz specifically mentioned uh, COCO, that this might be something we might want to, to, to look at. Members will will know that we've we held um, an all 
member session with the Chief Constable, Andy Marsh, and the um, Jess Ashton, the Area Commander for North Somerset. I think that was, was that early December, late November? Uh, we'd, we'd said, I think, to Jess that we would invite her back um, at least a couple of times a year, a couple of times a year to, 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 to have that, that engagement with, with, um, with the police. So just, just to flag that, um, that I'll take forward um, Councillor Willis' suggestion that we look at that as, as a panel, not in today's meeting, but, but, but separately, we'll need to sort of allocate some time to that. So I wanted to, to mention that. Um, John, uh, Councillor Lay Morgan. John, you at the last council meeting, you also made a statement on on China, and I think that's something again that we need to probably add to our to the, the scrutiny work plan. But it's important, I think, in terms of again reassurance that um, in terms of our supply chains and things. Um, so I think that's something that we will also again uh, not necessary for today, but something needs to go on to the work panel. John, I will consult with you specifically on this but we need to decide i think the best um format the best way of taking that forward um as part of our ongoing work i think that's all Thank I you chairman it's okay john um that's all the comments i wanted to make on that item normally that's an item we can move you know swiftly on from but there were just a few things there that have been raised in the last couple of council meetings any any questions or points from from colleagues on that i don't think so thank you very much for your time on that okay we'll, we'll move uh, forward to the substantive agenda so as i said before we'll take uh, what was agenda item eight is the winter gardens community board annual report and update um we have lorraine bush with us um lorraine is our policy and partnerships development officer so just to give a little brief preamble to this this is something that um Obviously, the, the, the council sold um, the uh, winter gardens to uh, Western College in 2016. But I think it was um, there's, there's the clause within that uh, legal transfer agreement that um, between the, the, the council and the college that uh, a community board would be set up. We have a, a, a nominated representative, which I think is Count Councillor Sarah Codling on that board. And I know that the, the board like to report to this panel annually. We last heard from um, Tams and Ben and, and Lorraine, I think it was, I think it was our, the first panel meeting, scrutiny panel meeting of this administration. So I think that was July 2019, wasn't it, Lorraine, when we looked at the 2018-2019 report. We were going to take the uh, 1920 annual report at the last November panel, but you know, given what had, what had been happening with with COVID and, and the lockdown, it was already a full agenda. So uh, we we bumped Lorraine to, to to this meeting. But as I say, it's important that we we get continuity. And uh, uh, Lorraine, I'd like to welcome you to today's meeting to to present your report, please. Over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I think I'll just start by saying up until March 2020, the community board um, for the Winter Gardens was actually meeting quarterly and really had a, a quite a good work programme and subgroups established. And there was tremendous commitment from the panel to ensure that um, the community was maximising the use of the, the Winter Gardens as a very prominent asset in, in Western. Um, unfortunately, the impact of the pandemic has had um, an impact on that, as we would all expect. And our focus now as a community panel has been very much about um, well, what, do, what do we do and how do we work together to encourage continued usage as we come out of the pandemic and build confidence for the community to come and use that tremendous asset again. Um, the unpredictability of the impact of COVID ha has meant that the Winter Gardens hasn't been able to open to the public since March. The very last event that the Winter Gardens held was a very high profile question time session um, that was televised and everything was looking great. And then it's been closed since then. 
Um, however, the college has been using the space very productively, and I've given examples for that in, in the covering report that I hope you've had an opportunity to see, as well as they've been working with us and our colleagues in public health very closely around um, uh, our testing operation, and that's been extremely valuable. So actually, the, the, the facility has been continued to be used uh, in the very best way during this pandemic, even though it hasn't been a public um, facing um, usage. Over this time as well, the college has taken the opportunity to review its business um, operating model. And by that, I'm referring mainly to its catering operations and how that could perhaps be more sustainable going forward. And the, um, as a result of that review, the findings will be coming to the community board um, to consider consider the findings and see how we can work um, collectively to support the implementation of that review moving forward. And when I'm talking about the board, I'm talking about um, representation from North Somerset Council, members of the community, and the business community alongside Western Town Council and Western College. So it brings together a, a whole range of different um, interests to ensure that we can maximise the potential of the facility. The AGM was held in October, as, as the chairman has explained, um, and we wanted to bring our annual report to this panel once again, even though it's not as perhaps comprehensive as the, as the last annual report. But we are we are keen to maximise the continuity of, of the work that's happening. And we, we look forward as a panel to working together to, for a bright future for the Winter Gardens. Um, so really, that's that's my introduction in a nutshell. Um, I'm very happy to take any queries about the recommendations that the community panel has come up with, or if indeed if it, um, members have any suggestions that they would like me to take back to the panel, I I welcome welcome the opportunity to do so. So thank you. Thank you very much, Lorraine, for that. Um, any question? Yeah, um, Councillor Payne, Robert. Um, yeah, thank you, Steve. I mean, I guess there's not very much to report because of the situation that we've had over the past year. Um, but I see in the report that um, <clears throat> the idea of uh, Friends of the Winter Gardens has been put on hold ending the, um, uh, the reopening. But I would have thought that such an organisation might be quite useful at helping to get it back open again and get it, getting things going again. So I wonder what your thoughts on that are, please. Um, certainly, it was a it was something that we were exploring as a panel to establish, um, and the motivation was really along the lines of I think the Playhouse also has a Friends of the Playhouse, so we were looking at whether we could develop something and learn from that experience. Unfortunately, at the stage where we were um, in developing that that initiative, which would involve bringing together a whole range of volunteers, volunteers have at this stage dispersed and are doing tremendous work in the community. But the focus on the winter gardens wasn't quite quite as high profile. So it isn't that we've um, we think that that's no longer a good idea. It's just a recognition of bringing people together in this climate was quite difficult at the stage that we were at in developing the work programme for it. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, thank you, Robert. Um, Terry, uh, Councillor Porter. Uh, sorry, um, I think, sorry, Peter, you were, you were first, I think, Peter Crew. Then Terry. Thanks, Chairman. Yeah, just before the pandemic uh, struck, we were in Western Town Council through tourism, which I chair. We're in discussions with the Winter Gardens with a view to transferring the uh, BIC into the front of the building. And the deal we were trying to strike, which the college wanted, was to take over us to take over looking after the building in terms of doing the bookings and checking people in, selling tickets for any events that they were putting on 
and that way we would have introduced uh, our group. We have roughly now 100 volunteers on Western Town Council working mainly at the museum, but to bring those on board, which we're doing this year with the, the VIC and the water park. So that was discussions taking place, but obviously because of all that happened, that uh, was put on hold, but that may actually start again. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. That's a terrific, a terrific alignment of um, effort actually between Western Town Council and and the Winter Gardens. So that would be tremendous to be able to take that forward in as we get as we come out of this situation. Peter, presumably you, are you uh, talking to to the exec member, Mike Councillor Mike Solomon, um, about how how we can utilise uh, the Winter Gardens as well in the in recovery. From the pandemic, I, I assume Mike's tuned in. He's a Western councillor as well, isn't he? He is, yeah. But th this conversation was, was, as I say, going back a bit uh, before Mike was in, in post, talking generally just with the uh, college. And actually, Pete Solomon was the one that we were uh, the negotiation was being done with. Okay, thanks, thanks, Peter. Catch the porter, Terry. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, it was just a little bit of history on this. I was very much involved when this uh, agreement was done, first of all. And to be honest, as a council, we got a lot of criticism because we were basically selling the Winter Gardens for a pound, which wasn't the case. We needed three million pounds worth of work done there. And we managed to get the money through the college uh, via the LEP for doing it. But one thing we wanted to do, because to be honest, I think this is the best venue we've got in the whole of North Somerset, if you're honest about it. You know, I can remember it for well. I've been going there for well, I was going there for well over 50 years, 60 years probably. And it was really good. And we wanted to protect it for the community. We had absolute faith that the college would do this, but we needed to make sure that, you know, the council still had an input into it to make sure that, you know, as a community uh, venue, it was it was there. And the college, you know, started to do a really good job once it moved into there. I got a big event organised there in October. Hopefully, if uh, everything happens, it might not, but... Uh, I think now it's a, it's a splendid venue and, you know, we ought to be encouraging much more use of it for the community. I know the college is using it as well, but it is, as I say, I still think it's the best venue we've got in, in North Somerset. I can't think of another one that compares to it. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. You don't look old enough to have been running around the Winter Gardens 50, 60 years ago. Uh, well, I'm, afraid, I, 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 I'm afraid I was. Well, so what was I, 17? So, yeah, that's, that's well, 58 years ago then, if you want that. <laughs> We'll wait, we'll, wait, we'll wait for the invite to, uh, to your October event. No, uh, thank you very much. Uh, any other questions, uh, panel, for, um, for the rain? Or any points you wanted to make? I can't see any more comments uh, or requests to speak. Is that right, Michelle? Do you, uh... yeah, 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 there's nothing else in uh, chat, Chairman. You're on mute, Councillor Bridger. That's the second time I've done that already in the, in the first uh, half an hour. It's not good. Um, thank you, Lorraine, very much for bringing the report. Um, last time, I okay. think I recall, we uh, I signed a letter, basically, sort of making it making a formal uh, sort of a formal note of, of receiving the, re the report. Um, so happy to do that again if that is deemed uh, necessary at all. But um, thanks for coming today. Thanks for your for a really good report, actually. Uh, thank thanks you very much. Thank you. Thank you. In which case, we'll now move on to uh, the next item on the agenda, which is green infrastructure strategy uh, or the consultation, really green infrastructure strategy consultation, a progress update. The officer uh, presenting is John Flanagan, Community and Environment Service Manager. So this is something again that uh, the panel will be aware that has come to uh, to this full panel before, and um, we've also had a, a couple of um, all member sessions as well, looking at some of some of the detail. This is out for con consultation. I think we're in the middle of the consultation, which started on the fifteenth of February, ends on the 9th of April, uh, which I think jo John, I'm sure, will emphasize. John, would you like to um, present your report, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, afternoon, everybody. 
Um, so I, I will quickly uh, run through the paper. Um, I, I, what uh, we're asking today is for members to um, consider the update of the strategy and uh, the consultation process that we're under going under. Um, we would appreciate some feedback about the strategy, not necessarily today, but ongoing until the, the date closes. Um, and we're also asking members to help promote awareness of the consultation as well. Um, the, the key thing, um, perhaps, that is uh, important to talk about is the um, actual consultation that we're carrying out. And I'll just quickly explain that. So as the chair said, it started on the 15th of February um, and um, ends on the 9th of April. Um, so we've got a, a range of uh, activities to promote the consultation. Um, and for example, it's on our web page um, and there is an e-consult consultation um, strategy as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it will be going in the April edition of eLife. It's actually in this March edition of North Somerset Life. So it should be going on to everybody's uh, doormats this month. We've already spoken to all the town councils and we're um, intending to uh, see the parish councils in uh, two separate meetings next week. Um, there's also um, a couple of workshops have been organised where we are meeting with um, specific stakeholders, local volunteer groups that are um, who do such great work out there in, in the natural environment. And that's on the 10th and uh, 11th of March. Um, and the other thing which uh, is, is proven to be effective is we put up 200 posters throughout the district on rights of way in parks and spaces and seafronts and so on, pointing people to um, the consultation exercise. So that's where we're at at the moment. Um, we, we would appreciate, as I said earlier, for members to help publicise the strategy through their channels, if that's possible. Um, and, uh, and again, to respond to the consultation. Um, I, I've got a few. Um, so it's been running since the fifteenth uh, uh, of February, and there's just a. Uh, so I've had a look at the consultation responses so far, and obviously this comes with a with a health warning because we're we're nowhere near finished. But I thought um, members might be interested to find out some of the responses that we've had so far, um, and uh, so we've had 123 responses uh, as of yesterday, um, and some of the uh responses are quite interesting so one of the questions we asked is what do people think is important about the natural environment um and uh, of the, these responses 70 percent have identified biodiversity 45 percent the health and well-being which is not perhaps um that's understandable bear in mind uh, the restrictions we've had under covid 39 percent uh of um said that climate change uh, is important to them 70 percent of these respondents visit our um visit the green infrastructure daily um, so that's a high percentage and it would be interesting whether that number sustains um, when the lockdown uh, restrictions are lifted because as everybody is probably aware there's been a lot of interest in um, outside and the natural environment and our parks and open spaces um, we also asked whether um, people um, think the strategy includes all the important features because we are mindful that we're not aware of every element in North Somerset. Sixty percent so far have said that it does, um, and sixty percent have also said that we've identified the uh, key opportunities. Um, and also, uh, which is good at this stage, it'd be interesting what happens throughout the rest of the consultation. But two thirds of respondents um, support the aims and objectives of the strategy, which is great. And a couple of quotes I picked out the best ones. Some people said, "Great to see this," and I hope you get on with it very soon. Um, as I say, there will be a lot of um, uh, more analysis of, of this as the time goes on. Um, but uh, say that won't end until uh, April and we'll keep you updated of that thereafter. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. Uh, any comments or questions from panel members to John? Oh, Councillor James got a look of it, Chairman. Hugh. Thanks, Michelle. Hugh. Uh, there we are. Sorry, I didn't have my notes in front of me. Um, so, yeah, I just came back from a Portishead Town Council meeting yesterday and they were generally really welcoming of the strategy. Um, I think in terms of consultation, I think that session with town councils is really valuable just because they didn't really know how to engage a bit. Um, from what they said, they thought it was very open ended and didn't quite 
know how to engage with it so that's just a bit of feedback from them i don't know the detail just because that is directly out of their sort of mouths um i know that uh the community groups <laughs> which we often mention uh uh were very appreciative of the workshop um and that a workshops offered um and the only thing to uh question is uh, I'm asking this because I'm asking for literally every strategy at the moment. Do, are you collecting demographic data at the end of it? Because the local plan that was really useful to collect um, to just understand who's accessing and how. Uh, so uh, are you collecting that uh, demographic data and data about where people found out about the consultation? So we are <laughs> collecting. Yes. Yeah, so I think that so there's a standard uh, questions that we ask in terms of demographics, so they are part of this. Uh, but in actual fact, I don't think we've asked where they've where they did pick up the strategy, and um, perhaps we could add that in now. It's a good idea. Bro, that's really good. Thank you very. Much. Thanks, thanks, Hugh. Uh, any other questions for for, for John? I, I can't see any. Um, I wanted to to mention something here. Actually, I, I in my conversations, uh, this is I think a, an incredibly important piece of work, and obviously there's lots of other um, really important things we want to deliver deliver as a council hanging off of of this. I'm also very aware in my conversations that I have I have with with officers that that John and his team are relatively, they're not as well resourced, should we say, as, as, as perhaps some of our other teams. I know we've lost as a council, you know, we've lost half, half the staff, frankly, that we had 10 years ago. But I think John's, I think that the work that John's team is bringing forward is incredibly important. And I don't think he has the resources, um, particularly in terms of um, probably the, the communications backup that that team might might need. So, for example, I think we have um, some, you know, some really good comms around the broad, uh, the waste, the waste service, for example. I don't think John specifically has necessarily that the, the support he would probably like. Uh, I'm not suggesting we can make, make a wave a magic wand and um, make that happen, but I'll be quite uh, interested to hear what what um, panel members think, but I, I'd quite like us as a panel to be able to uh, well to get support really from from panel members to, to suggest that we make representations to the relevant executive member or, or, or members, pro probably Councillor Nicola Holland, I, I guess. See if we could look at the support that. Uh, not just John's team, but the, the, all all of the officers who are helping us deliver on our climate emergency goals, um, to see if we can we can possibly look at how we can better support um, the delivery of those goals through through communications and have a look at how we might resource that. As as I say, no no uh, magic wand or anything, but. I've become aware in in the last week or two that you know a while ago we actually had a separate scrutiny panel, for example, looking at environmental services, and we had a lot more officers who were I think on the ground embedded in communities um, than we have now. And at just the point I think that this is this is clearly this 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 area of work is is a is a priority for this council uh, it, it's front and center within the within the corporate plan i just feel that we at least need to perhaps um have a look at how we can better support uh, the work of our officers in terms of um communications and engagement so obviously the communications and engagement strategy is a is a when early days that's another piece of work and i think we'll we'll perhaps um flag that later on and when we look at the work plan but I don't know. That's that's my sense, but um, I, I'd like to to look to, to panel members to either um, support that possibly as a recommendation from from today's meeting, or, or obviously open to counter arguments as well. But uh, Peter, you you've got you ha your hand up, Councillor Crew. Thank you, Chairman. 
Uh, yeah, just because we're in a public meeting, just to make it clear that some of us aren't asking questions for a simple reason is we're on the working party dealing with this very subject. But you are right. The difficulty is uh, John's team do such a good job and they're very responsive when you have a problem that it's sometimes hidden the fact they work on very small budget and very few people. And yes, I think we do need more support there. Uh, and I, I think John does need some extra bodies to carry out all the work they do, even though they're doing a fantastic job with limited resource. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for that. Um, and seconded, the team do a fantastic, fantastic job with the resource they've got. Um, John, Councillor Cater. Uh, yes, thank you, Steve. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. I completely support what you said. Um, I was thinking myself, how can we as members, what particular focus, John Flanagan, would you like uh, us to support you in our communications with? You know, how, how can we help? John, I know it's, it's putting you on the, the spot. Am I muted? No, I'm uh, not muted. Thank, thank you. Um, so I, I think there are um, so there, there are several layers to this. I, I think generally just the um, sharing our objectives and, and the strategy would be really useful for people to understand that. And I think probably in terms of green infrastructure, the wide ranging nature of it, how it, it, it cuts across all sorts of different areas. And, I, and, I, and I, I think people are becoming more and more aware of that. But that's that's an important element. And um, I, I also think uh, another part of this is volunteering and and, and people helping, uh, you know, helping us and themselves and their communities manage their open spaces. Um, so. Uh, there's probably a few more things, but they're the things that are top of my head. So, make I just come back on you there, John? You said about volunteering. How, in how would uh, how would people step up to volunteer um, in this? What, what, what sort of way would you want that to happen? So, <laughs> so this is the this is the bit of the conundrum because it, it is a, a strain on resources to to manage volunteers, but the output is so valuable. Um, but simple things like litter picking, if people are out picking up litter when they're around, maybe clearing the weeds up in the pavement outside the house. Um, and, and there are groups that are set up across um, North Somerset that are, that are established um, and not necessarily just associated with the council that people might want to join. I mean, they, they get good exercise from it. They learn stuff from it and they meet people from doing it. So there are, there are good reasons for doing it, I think. OK, thank you. I'll, I'll reflect on that and see what, uh, what comes out. Thank you. Thank you, John. Or, uh, uh, thank, and thank you, John. Um, John Flanagan. Uh, John, I wanted to ask you uh, uh, as well about uh, other documents that might, that I don't think we have, that might support the strategy. So, for example, um, the I'm aware of the, you know, the, the, the quite high profile sort of state state of nature report that gets quite a lot of coverage or got quite a lot of coverage. I mean, we it would be good to be able to, to be able to get into a get to a place where we could say, you know, this is the state of nature in North Somerset. Um, you know, and we don't have a biodiversity target as, as, as such, do we? But uh, again, you know, very just I'm so aware that the workload for you and your team has just sort of rock, rocketed and we talk about these things um but I mean being able to communicate to the to our residents you know what the state of nature is in North Somerset would be I think a you know a fantastic fantastic thing to be able to do obviously something we couldn't do ourselves we'd have to it would have to be maybe it's even a community-led uh project with with our support but are you aware of other other areas of the country who at a sort of a, a, a local level, hyper local level have have sort of something like uh, who, who sort of publish the state of nature in their districts or is that sort of by in the sky? Am I going off on one? Uh, no, the, <laughs> no, there are um, that sort of um, activities around the country. Um, I think that the, the one of the 
issues that needs to be addressed generally is environmental data, because without that data, it's hard to do that that state of nature. But what's interesting, and uh, it'd be good to bring this back to the panel, maybe not the next one, but the one after, is that the Environment Agency have just created a natural capital tool, and um, that starts to break down the value of the natural capital assets. And that's like a really good starting point, I think, to, 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 to be able to evaluate the state of um, the natural world. Um, allied to that, there are by the way, it's really quite complicated, and they've just sent it to us, and it, it's going to be a bit of a work through to, to, to get it um, up to date for North Somerset. But allied to that, there is some regional work going on about um, phase one uh, wildlife data. So that will give us a better idea of, about how uh, wildlife is distributed across um, the area. So there are some things that are coming together, Chair, which I think perhaps um, we could talk about and, and bring together and, and share it with the panel, because I think it's um, it, it will be eye-opening, but I think it's also be interesting, and um, perhaps that, that might be the way that we address that. And I can also research in a bit more detail other places that have done something similar as well. Yeah, that, 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 would, be, that would be great. Thank you, John. Uh, any other comments from panel members on uh, on John's report at this stage. Um, I can't see any, Michelle, is that, is that right? No, no, there's no, no comments, Chairman. So what I'm minded to do then is that we, we note uh, John's report and that we um, we bring forward a, a further recommendation again not quite sure of of, of wording but I, i'm sense that there's, there's there's there'll be panel support anyway for um at least making a representation to the appropriate executive member around seeing what we can do at least you know uh, uh, exploring what we can do to, to better support john and his team in terms of communications um and some some of that will be uh possibly things we we might not be able to do so there's an element of, of managing members expectations i think probably on this as well but we're we're ambitious as a council in this area um we might not be able to do absolutely everything that we've kind of set ourselves up to do but you know um councillor pay robert you brought you brought forward the um the nature emergency motion recently um it there's a lot of, which had a lot of really 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 good stuff in it um, so I think, so as I say, I think as I, I'm taking from 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 this conversation, there'll be um, support from this this panel to to uh, take that forward as a, as a further re recommendation, in addition to the the points that John has in his report for for noting. Um, I won't put that to a vote, but if 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 I could, if I generally see nods <laughs> uh, from from colleagues, thank you very much. Um, we'll make sure that that um, gets 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 minuted. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you very much. Um, thank thank you and your team for everything you're doing in this area. Brilliant work. Thank you, Chair. Right. Uh, Thank you. So we'll move on to um, the next item on the agenda, which is uh, the Your Neighbourhood Consultation and Engagement, sort of an update on where we are with lots of different pieces of work. So there's actually quite a lot to get through here. Um, there's some matters that uh, I wanted to uh, discuss at today's panel in a little bit of detail. Obviously, one of those would be, I'm sure uh, panel members would also want to raise it, uh, garden waste. Um, and the other one was something that I'm particularly keen on, which is um, enforcement. Uh, we have a new enforcement contract. Um, it's not huge, but it's a new contract that will be starting, kicking off next next month and i'm particularly aware of uh, and i know that uh, other members are too particularly councillor crosby in, in clevedon that we obviously faced um i think all not just north somerset but all councils were surprised last 
when was it April, May, June, uh, as it was it May, wasn't it? As we came out of the first lockdown at things like littering, uh, the extent of that littering and and um, and the impact that had on uh, residents. And given the timing of the relaxation of, of, of the current um, lockdown, I can foresee a similar thing happening. So I think we need to be better prepared this year than we were last year when we could have perhaps foreseen what it'd be like. So I, that we'll have a separate little bit of a discussion, I think, on, on what we plan to do around in, uh, what we can do around enforcement. So we'll take this, I think. Um, so there's a number of items, leisure and sports centres, libraries, uh, parts and open spaces, street cleaning. I think is Gemma Dando with us? Is Gemma, are you with us? I think I can see. I am, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Gemma, am I right in saying you'll you'll take us through some of these, some of those um, updates, and then right. Colin and Lizzie and, and, and Chris. Uh, will take us through in, in perhaps a little bit more depth garden waste um, just to to see where we are with that and um, and the enforcement piece so over to you Gemma thank you um, Steve just a quick question did you have any preference about which you'd like to take first the details pieces the enforcement and street cleansing or the garden waste I think um I wanted, I think probably, so we, we give enough time to garden waste enforcement. If we take those at the end, okay. and if we cover off, we cover, cover off your, what you want to talk to first, which I... Uh, yeah, mine's quite short, so I was going to bring in yeah. those two items as I went along. Um, so if I do, if uh, I think garden waste is the first item on the no your neighbourhood consultation piece. So if I quickly review the things that we're not talking about today, then do garden waste followed by enforcement. Does that sound OK? Um, so are you, are you agreeing with me that you, you're taking some of those so, other? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm just mindful that we might talk for a bit on garden waste. And I, yeah. I, I'd rather we we didn't start with that and then, okay, and then squeeze the other items. Okay, we'll, we'll, it. we'll play it by ear a bit. We'll see how we go. Sure. Um, sorry about that, everybody. Um, so the, as you will hopefully remember, um, about this time last year, slightly earlier, we launched a big piece of consultation work called Your Neighbourhood. And the aim was to talk to people in their communities and get lots of feedback via a consultation on some of the uh, services that people experience in their neighbourhood. And the consultation included five different strands, which were garden waste, leisure and sports centres, libraries, parks and open spaces, and street cleansing. Um, and all of those different strands of engagement and um, communication uh, resulted in different work streams which scrutiny all the way through have been involved with and I, I'm going to give you an update on today and invite some of my colleagues to give detailed updates on some of those areas. Um, so it, just as a reminder we had um, just under 2,000 people that responded to the consultation. It did generate a lot of interest and that was um, two months out of the three month consultation were the beginning of COVID lockdown as well. So and we had quite a lot of success in getting people interested in the consultation engagement. Um, so since we closed the consultation in May, um, a number of pieces of work have gone on alongside scrutiny, alongside our executive. Um, the, the first one's about leisure. So we asked people about the leisure provision that they used, um, whether it was council or non-council leisure provision. And um, we asked them what was required for in their neighbourhoods and how they exercised. And um, we asked them specific questions about council facilities as well as private facilities. Um, and what that helped us do was to finalise and put together a leisure strategy for North Somerset. Um, that strategy was adopted by, by the executive, having been through a, um, a scrutiny working group a number of times to get some really good scrutiny input into it. Um, 
and the next steps for that. So we've got a strategy which sets out what um, what we want to do with our leisure provision for the next um, 16 years. So it takes us up to 2036. And the, the next steps are to turn that strategy into an action plan with some really specific actions. So um, which leisure centres and sports facilities are we going to put our attention to and um, which things specifically need investment or sort of and, and this is potentially large scale investment so the first step of that we're in the process of contacting um, town councils where we have some of our leisure um, provision just to get a, a, an update from the town councils about their own plans and views on leisure provision in their area um, and we'll blend that with all of the other information we already know from the consultation and work alongside scrutiny and start coming up with an action plan over the next year and um, we're doing this alongside the council's asset strategy and the intention is to have a draft um, action plan which talks about those the specific projects that we want to take forward sometime in the autumn this year because it is very related obviously to our asset strategy because a lot of our leisure provision is takes place within our assets so that's the intention and again sort of conversations with Steve and the leisure group have shown an appetite for keeping on and working with us on these um, these pieces of work um, similarly the libraries consultation that we took as part of the your neighborhood consultation and um, again we've put together a library strategy which looks at the sort of um, services service provision and achievements that we'd like to deliver through our libraries and there were four main things that were identified the first is around education reading literacy the, the more traditional what you'd expect from your library and um, the second one was about community engagement and libraries being um, places in the community where people go to and have social interactions and um, and sort of meets their community so a, a important place in the community and um, the, the third area is around libraries as places where people can get support with skills and employment and um, boost the local economy and the, the fourth area is about health and well-being and the role that libraries can play in enhancing the health and well-being of local communities and so again that strategy was recently adopted in February executive and again the next stages are to think again alongside the asset strategy think about turning those aspirations into some really clear time scaled actions that start delivering against that strategy and with similar time scales to leisure so we are looking to work alongside our asset strategy we um, during the development of the library strategy there was quite a there was an opportunity for town and parish councils to look at the draft strategy and comment on it um, we're intending to go back to local councils and have another conversation with them about provision in their areas and uh, again alongside working with councillors and um, using the information we've got from our consultations and working with some other groups start developing that strategy towards the end of the year so that, that was um, libraries and leisure and the progress we've made and the plans for the next sort of six to eight months and um, the other areas of the consultation one of them was parks and green spaces and um, so we so oh god sorry Steve. Yeah, yeah I was just going to sorry for interrupting I was just no, going to no, see no, if no. we pause you there I think after okay. before we go on to parks and open spaces and take leisure leisure and libraries together just to see whether there were any uh, questions or comments that that uh, panel members had for you if that was okay sure um i can't see any hands up but i, d I wanted to ask you uh thanks robert i'll come to you in a sec whether we'd heard yet we 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 bid for some government money didn't we on the leisure front along with probably many many other uh authorities um have we have we heard back from from government yes we have oh, and no. we had good news we got four hundred and seventy thousand pounds in the grant fund so um that that is to support the leisure providers um for their sorry leisure. sorry Gemma. I, I you're a bit fuzzy at times i didn't oh. catch the figure please what what was the figure four hundred and seventy thousand pounds so, oh. yeah 
That was to support the leisure providers um, through the various periods of lockdown and make sure that they're able to reopen on the 12th of April or beyond so that we, we have leisure provision ready to go um, when it's allowed to reopen. Gemma, was that the, I'll come to you in a second, John, was that the indicative figure that, that we'd heard that we were in for? Or was it more? Yeah, that, that it was slightly more than the indicative figure, but not much. Um, and we we bid for slightly more than that. And we're waiting to hear whether there's any possibility of getting some extra money at the moment. OK, um, I'll go to... Um, Councillor Payne, and then Councillor Cato, and then John, uh, Councillor Lane Morgan, we'll, we'll come to you. Haven't forgotten. Uh, Robert. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask, um, when, when looking at the library's strategy, um, would there be consideration given to the location of, of where the libraries are? I'm thinking particularly of Western Library, which was moved into the town hall a few years ago, and I'm not really sure that it is the best place for it or the most convenient for for the community, I feel it ought to be somewhere, for example, near the high streets or something like that. But anyway, would there be consideration to the location of, of the libraries? That's my question, really. Um, short answer is yes, and that's why we're doing these um, strategy, the action planning work alongside the asset strategy action planning work. So exactly that. We want to think, make sure that our facilities are in the right location for the people that would like to use them. Thank you, Gemma. Thanks, Robert. Um, John Cato uh, and then John Lay Morgan. John. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just uh, briefly, Gemma, forgive me. If you, if you don't hold your microphone up, it might even get better. I don't know, um, in terms of the fuzzy. But anyway, I wanted to say that on both of these things, the fact that you're developing a specific action plan and you're engaging with the local parishes and town councils and so on, I, I think is brilliant. It uh, you know, feels to me like a really sensible, well-structured way to go, and I approve of it highly. Thank you. Thank you, and apologies for the sound quality. I'm, yeah, My team isn't being particularly good today, sorry. Thanks, Gemma. Thanks, John. Councillor Lay Morgan. John. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, Gemma, I, I was hoping that with that, uh, some of that money could be used to purchase activity equipment in all sort of park areas uh, where people can uh, yeah, use balance. Uh, so that uh, because otherwise they can just perhaps or perhaps the public is more inventive than I give them credit for. Did you pick that up, uh, Gemma? John broke yeah, broke I, a bit for me, but it might be just me. It, it was fuzzy, but I think it was about outdoor gym equipment. Is that right, Councillor Morgan? Lay Morgan, sorry. Um, so the money that we've got can't be used for that. It has to be used to um, bring the, the our indoor existing leisure facilities back into use after COVID. So it was quite a specific fund that we got money from. However, I think that um, we can will certainly include the idea about outdoor gym equipment and other um, initiatives like that and there are some conversations ongoing at the moment and we can include that in some of the considerations for, um, for some of the parks and green spaces work that we'll be doing um, and I, I suppose it would be really interesting actually if people responded to the green infrastructure consultation with those sort of requests because we can use them later if that is. It didn't come out very strongly, I must admit, in the other consultation that we've done. So we didn't get a great deal of requests for outdoor gym equipment, either in parks or in um, the leisure consultation. But if that is something that people would like, then it would be great if they could complete the green infrastructure consultation and maybe include some of that. Can I just interrupt just a second, um, Steve, yeah. just to say, yes. Gemma, if you don't, what I think Councillor Cato was saying is if you don't put that microphone to your mouth, you we're getting all the interruption when you put it close to your lips. 
um, it's worth a shot because we're we're losing quite a few of your you know your lovely words. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that. don't be, don't be. I think this is what Councillor Cato was saying. Don't put it up to your mouth. Um, okay. I think so too. Give it a try. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we'll see. <laughs> Wait, th thanks, Jill. Um, Gemma, the uh, are we st how how are we with are we on track for for Backwell Pool to be opening in April? I know it's had some refurbishments yeah. and uh, also a, a, perhaps a live update on on where we are with Churchill Pool. I, I I know I've seen a survey which I think is from there's a local working group, isn't there? I think which we're, we're supporting as a council. I know that I've seen. Um, and completed actually a survey that um, has been just dis been distributed around social media and things. But I wonder if you had an update on, on Backwell and Churchill. Um, so the works in Backwell are going well um, and are on track to be completed on or around the 12th of April. Um, in terms of when the facility is going to reopen, um, we're working with the contractor on the um, basically because it was closed for so long. Um, instead of putting people on furlough, I think they moved quite a lot of people around and made some redundancies. Um, so we're having to re-employ people and make sure we've got enough staff for that facility or our contractors are having to do that. So the reopening is going to be based on, um, uh, the works will be complete, but we need to make sure that the facility is ready to reopen. And we want to reopen it when we're certain it will be able to, after employing quite a large staff group, we need to be confident that it, it's ready to open and will remain open. So. Um, I think we're, we're working very closely with the contractor, first of all, to be confident that the 12th of April is the right date so we can start employing people. If there's any uncertainty about that as we look at the data, there is a chance that that facility might be slightly after the others because it takes a little while to recruit people. But the works are done and it's ready to open. It's absolutely opening as soon as possible, so, but it's just down to the recruitment of the staff at the moment. And um, and Churchill. So Churchill, we're a slightly different situation. So um, the because the contract was up this year, and because it was closed anyway because of um, COVID, it wasn't able to open. Um, we're just, we're still working on some options about what happens next for Churchill. So as you'll know, one of the original ideas was uh, a sort of community ownership model, maybe a trust or involving the school and some local people. So we've got a great working group in the area who are really involved. And um, obviously, at the moment, a school even thinking about taking on something like a trust is just not the right timing because obviously children have missed so much school and there's so many educational priorities to think about. And um, that we're, we're starting to think a little bit wider about what the future options are. Um, so we, we are working closely with the community and we've got some really good information coming back from that survey that's being hosted by the local community. Um, we're at the point of, so we've, we have approached um, to, as an indication some other contractors just to see what they do with the facility if we need to do something different for the next few years. So we're, just, we're, we're really exploring options for that site and really thinking about what next. We, there isn't an obvious solution, I think. We, it's quite tricky. There isn't an obvious solution, but we're keen to continue working with that local community and also to explore every possible option and then start looking at as usual the costs and the investment required and just think about what next but we haven't got a, 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 a way forward yet unfortunately it's just the times and circumstances of the in terms of the original plan of a school-based community-based trust just it aren't good it's not quite right for this moment it's not right for the school so we're just having to think a little bit differently thanks Gemma uh, we we're still getting a lot of uh, interference, but we can just we can just about hear you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, and one other point on on libraries. Um, we at the, la at the last panel meeting, um, Simone Davy uh, brought brought a report about the uh, town hall gateway. Um, so obviously we know once once council offices will re reopen, people won't be able to sort of just drop in to. Um, to reception to the gateway there in, in, in town hall, they'll need to make an appointment. 
as a as a panel we were i think we understood uh, the reasoning behind that but we we did have quite a quite a number of concerns and i think we were interested in being able to explore the the potential for uh, i i think you probably know this already you know for I, i'm not sure how we phrased it but a, a, a more um dispersed you know federal system so you know if people were able to uh make appointments um to speak to to speak to to someone in a in a library um stroke community hub you know closer to closer to where they live um you know i think i think a few of us i mean maybe possibly this is an informal piece of work with an interest, interested group of um elected members out, outside of the, the panel to, to look at but i think we were mindful of that there might be some opportunities there uh, again as you were saying Gemma with the, the the library strategy and the action plan coming from that well it's going to be aligned to the, to the asset strategy that, that 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 piece of work but I think you know it was certainly a concern that um, but obviously there needs to be a solution for people who live in western too doesn't there in, in, in particular so I don't know whether there's certainly some conversations to be had. I know it's probably early days, but I'm I'm sure that there are a number of elected members who'd be quite keen to engage with you and and um, Emma Wellard and, and and Simone on 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 that. Um, yeah, oh, uh, okay. We've got Councillor Crew, Peter, and then um, Councillor James Hugh after Peter. Peter. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Just following up on what you said there. Yes, we did say when Gateway was closing that. Uh, what we need to do is build up on the library side where people can go in, look at uh, applying for their uh, blue badge and all other council services that they can do on the spot or book an appointment, whichever way they do it. And recognising the fact in some cases, some of the libraries will need some changes around in order to do that. But it's one of the things that's a big plus because the number of people, especially elderly people who live around in this area, obviously being able to go to the campus and do, do these things rather than have to get a bus into the town hall is a big plus. Oh, thank you, Peter. Uh, Hugh. Yeah, just tying into that, um, it sort of also ties into the asset strategy too, but um, job centre. Sorry, Hugh, you're breaking you off for me. me. Oh, God. I can now, I can now but it broke. We're having a few a few issues today. Uh, is that working? Yes. Yes. Brilliant. Um, so yes. So what I was going to say is tied into um, what you're saying about the use of libraries uh, for Gateway. Um, uh, if Job Centre can decentralise a bit and use our libraries, it would be very uh, gratefully received. Just I don't know if their plans are to continue doing universal credit things remotely post pandemic but um you know going to uh clevedon it can be quite difficult for a lot of our residents um when there's a lack of bus infrastructure um so um if there was that tying with all these different services to the libraries that would be very gratefully received and also um uh i know the library is already doing great work with um uh digital enablement sort of stuff um but if, if that could you know uh, continue but more so at the moment uh, as soon as lockdown ends I think that would be very useful too. <laughs> Thank you those are all really helpful comments because they are all aspirations and they're, you will see them all in the action plan. Um, I suppose the, what we're trying to do is get to the point where we understand how exactly we're going to deliver that and whether there's any cost implications and we so we've already we're already starting to set up some of those partnerships and conversations but the action plan will get to focus specifically on some of those areas because you're right they're absolutely crucial the uh, libraries as a community hub and libraries as a place to go to get work and employment and skills and access to digital um so yes yeah, we'd but it'd be good to i, I think with the chat I had with Steve outside of this meeting, we talked about um, having scrutiny's involvement as we work through the action plan so that we can make sure that those things are picked up as well. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, Gemma, do you want to, to, to move on now to um, Parts and Open Spaces? I will. 
And so obviously you've heard from John already today about the green infrastructure strategy. So some of the information that we gathered as part of the Your Neighbourhood consultation has helped mould some of the content of the, the green infrastructure strategy. Um, and that's obviously in consultation at the moment. Um, the other thing that we've done since the Your Neighbourhood consultation was to, um, so we've at the February for, uh, executive meeting, it was the contract extension for parks and green spaces and for street cleansing was approved for another for five years, but with a two year break clause. So we can really have a look at how we deliver those services um, moving forward and do an analysis of how best to deliver them. So is it through a contract? Is it potentially through a different method? So obviously we've got our own company now, the North Somerset Environment Company, which goes live on the 26th of March. Um, so, we can, so we've given ourselves an opportunity to review that as a potential future possibility. Um, and we've used some of the information that we got from the Your Neighbourhood consultation just to make sure that as we move forward into the next two years of that contract, we're picking up some of the things that people told us about that they'd either like to see more of in the contract or um, we, we can shuffle things around and we have got quite an appetite to make sure that we, we build in a different sort of monitoring for the next two years so we can make sure we do pick up um, some of the requests coming through scrutiny and lots of other organisations. So lots of local organisations have got some requests. And um, I think Steve articulated it well earlier. We do have a very limited staff group working on some of these things. So we, we're we doing our best with what we've got. Um, we do have some flexibility in the contract. So we do have an appetite to, to make the contract as good as it possibly can be with the resource that we've got. So um, you should see that over the next year or so as we're also looking at future options for those services. Um, so in terms of, so I'll, I'll pause there for a second because um, that's about the contract and obviously you've already heard about parks and green spaces and some of the green infrastructure work that's moving forward and then I think after this if we move on to the enforcement piece and the street cleansing piece and then finish with garden waste. So if I after any questions about parks and green spaces, if I then invite my colleagues in to go into more detail about enforcement, um, hopefully that will work. Thanks, Jim. I have one point on, on parks and green spaces, parks particularly, I, I guess. We, um, you'll recall we had some some really good engagement sessions with town and parish councils was at the end of November, beginning of December, I think. You, you were at a lot of them and I, I was at a few of them. They were really interesting. And I guess parks and open spaces was one of those areas, was a sort of common theme, I suppose, through through a lot of those sessions where there was the potential for, again, it's, I mean, it's an area where communities, I, I think, would like to be able to sort of shape their you know the community assets this is rather than seeing the, the rather than us as the council sort of just sort of direct you know providing services this is an area we we touched on in a lot of those sessions i don't know whether there's been any it won't look the same in every town and village of course it will be different in western as to, to what it is in yatton or, or wherever but i don't know whether there's been any um further conversations you might have had with with richard blows and his team or various various other bits of the the organisation as a result of those engagement sessions? Um, so what we've started doing, so yes, I've, um, I think Richard blows quite a lot actually because we're, <laughs> we're regularly trying to blend our pieces of work so that we do make the most of the, the contacts in local communities. Um, one of the things that we, we started, I think probably just before Christmas, is a piece of work with Porter's Head on the lake grounds. And we, we're using it as a pilot to see how best the council and town councils can work together on um, green spaces in their area. So with, with Porter's Head, we're looking at a couple of different things. One is to refresh the the plan for the site jointly so we're doing some joint visioning and joint action planning for that site so that with the council and town council are completely aligned about what we think the best thing is for that piece of green space and then the other thing we're doing alongside that is coming up with some potential models and a proposal for Porter's Head about how the council and the town council are going to work together and who's going to do what and 
what the town council might invest in, what the council are able to provide and potentially invest in because some new money has become available recently. Um, our intentions to use that work then to take to other places and think about some other green spaces or, or even, I mean, it could be used across a whole variety of services. But it's, it's just trying to model how best we can work cooperatively and use our resources in a shared way on some of these key sites and um, key interest sites. Um, so it's again, it's something that um, we're doing just with a, select, a, a small selection of town councillors initially, but obviously with each reporting back to our organisations and we're hoping to come out of it with a really good model of collaborative working. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gemma. Any questions, uh, further questions for Gemma on parks and open spaces? Hugh. Yeah, for that one, uh, just uh, if when you are able to widen it, you can widen it out to Port Said District Councillors, that'd be very useful, um, <laughs> uh, very <laughs> helpful, um, yeah. since it's obviously an area that a lot of our community are very interested in. Um, and uh, uh, the only other thing is in the Portstead Town Council meeting yesterday, they wanted how um, uh, third party money, you know, this sort of community funding and community support might be used to add to the money that North and Set Council and Portstead Town Council are willing to add on their own part. So just just feeding that in, um, in terms of, um, I know that EDF was mentioned, given that um, given that uh, they're dumping their mud in front of Porter's Head, we wondered whether they might help us dump our mud elsewhere too. <laughs> Great. Um, I think, yes, it's a, we're, do, we're doing it in a quite a collaborative way at the moment. So it means that we haven't got any reports to share, but as soon as we do, we'll, we'll share them. Um, and the obvious answer is yes to any extra <laughs> money to add to the pot so that we can invest in the green space. But um, I'll, I'll talk, I've got a meeting with Paul on Tuesday, so we, we will talk about um, communications because we're getting to a point in our joint working where it would be good to start talking about it a bit more widely. So I'll talk to Paul on Tuesday and see how we can um, do, do some updates maybe a little bit wider so that people know what's going on. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Gemma. Thanks, Hugh. Um, Je sorry, Gemma. Were you saying you were going to take we were going to take street cleansing with the enforcement? Yeah. Piece? So yeah, I would uh, suggest um, inviting Chris in. I think Chris is going to yeah. take through some slides about enforcement, and then if when it comes to the questions part, if we just take questions as well about street cleansing at that point, that probably yeah, works quite well. Yeah, we'll do that, and then we'll and then we'll get to garden waste. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, Chris. Hi all, and um, thanks a lot, Gemma. Um, I have got a presentation I'll just load up. Hopefully the IT behaves. Can you all see that? Uh, not. Uh, it's coming, I think. There we are. Yes, I can see that. Uh, okay. At least that's the IT's behaving today. Um, yeah. So don't, I don't tempt fate. <laughs> um, I'll just give a quick update on um, sort of the public space protection orders and, and the updates. I know some of you or um, a lot of you will probably have known that um, the existing public space protection orders were um, reviewed and then it was decided to renew them all back in September. Um, and that sort of renew renewal process identified some additional PSPO requirements that, that we believe would benefit the district. Um, and that's now been subject to a public consultation which closed um, and was signed off in February by the council's executive. Um, so the new and amended orders, there, there's quite a lot, but um, in there there's orders around Abbots Pool Nature Reserve, which was quite an issue for, um, I know, John Flanagan's team had, had a lot of issues there with antisocial behaviour. Um, there's also area-wide orders on failing to stop playing music in, in public places. Um, and also for the waste team in particular, there's now an order around um, inconsiderate parking, obstructing waste vehicles, um, which includes emergency services as well. So we'll be able to warn residents um, if they park inconsiderately and block waste collections or recycling collections um, and then obviously if they keep doing it we can use the PSPOs to sort of 
further enforce that they they do keep the roads clear um, and also it's extended the list of public buildings where we can take action when people are being behaving in, in a manner which causes annoyance or a nuisance um, so that now includes all our leisure centers which would be really useful when they open back up um, our recycling centers Again, we had quite a lot of antisocial behaviour when locked down, when they reopened in the first lockdown. Um, and that has decreased, but it, it still happens too often, really. Um, so that will really help us. And also across venues such as the Tropicana. Um, and the public space protection order is going to be enforced by all the authorised council staff, but also local authority support um, who we are employing on a 12 month trial basis um so just the pspo sort of overview review process um timeline as you can see i haven't actually done any of this work um it was d morn and, and harry mills that have done most of it um but as you can see we're getting towards the end of the process now and the new and uh, amended orders will come into force in april um the rollout will include training for all our authorised staff. Um, this will include North Somerset Council enforcement officers, police officers, um, PCSOs and the local authority support officers who will be trained by the company, but also will get additional training from us. So we ensure that they're sort of following our processes in how they deal with members of the public. Um, there'll also be additional signage put across the district in um, the new areas where there were no orders previously, um, but also amended signage where it's needed. Um, and we'll also put out on sort of social media press releases that the, the PSPOs have been um, amended and there's new ones in order. So, so the public should be um, completely aware when they go into an area that there are restrictions or requirements in place on their behaviour. Um, so local Authority support um, will come in. They're a private company. I've, I know we've met before to discuss this contract. Um, so there's, there's possibly a little bit of a change. So we were going to, littering was going to be enforced under the Environmental Protection Act, um, but to keep it sort of simple and all under one umbrella, really, um, they're now going to enforce multiple, a sort of suite of um, offences under the PSPO. Um, and this will hopefully simplify the process, but also allow us to, to be enforcing it under the same legislation as local authority support. Um, so this will include littering, dog fouling, um, not having means to pick up, which is not under dog bag, pretty much. Um, dogs in exclusion areas and dogs off leads in areas where you have to have your dog on a lead. Um, urination and, and defecation in public, which I'm always surprised has to be included, but unfortunately it does. Um, and driving a vehicle, which was already in the PSPO, but it also now includes bikes, um, because I know there's been some issues on sort of Western seafront with people riding bikes in sort of aggressive manners. Um, so the work that local authority support will take on will be um, they'll effectively patrol problem areas, um, so seafronts, town centres, um, generally where we have high footfall. Um, but, but to be honest, anywhere in the district where we have issues, we can send them to. Um, some offences will be sort of zero tolerance, so littering, dog fouling, they will issue on the spot fixed penalty notices for. Um, there might be others such as street drinking where people will be warned first and asked to stop. Um, and, and then they'll only be issued the fixed penalty notice if, if they refuse or, or they're found to be doing it again. Um, on top of the sort of enforcement work that local authority support will be undertaking, there is an educational part of the work they're doing. Um, so you'll, you'll all be glad to hear it isn't all walking around issuing fixed penalty notices. They do engage with members of the public. They'll be giving um, communications out, speaking to members of the public, going into businesses for us. Um, they've offered to do schools talk and they've also offered to provide the 
um, presentations that they use for for our staff to go into schools. Obviously, once we can. Um, so there is a there's quite a large amount of sort of educational work that they also get involved in, um, and also from our point of view, it's extra sort of um, eyes and ears around the district reporting issues, um, and and they hopefully become sort of part of the team really. Um, the contract rollout. So we're looking at it was April. It may be pushed back by um, a couple of weeks, uh, mainly down to the, the two issues that are sort of detailed below. Um, but we're still confident it'll be put in place sort of mid to late April, start of May. Um, so there's a decision required by um, it's with Nick Brain and Legal Services around our constitution and whether we can authorise um, external staff, in this case local authority support, um, to enforce um, legislation for us, so delegate our authority to them. Um, so hopefully we'll get a decision from that for that over the next week. Um, but local authority support are sort of mobilising the contract as much as they can without um, without that decision so they're so they're planning uniforms and, and things like that and um so it shouldn't hold it up too much once the decision's made obviously if it's not possible um we will then need to amend the constitution which will require a full council vote um and then there's also a bit of clarification with um legal and the magistrates court around how we manage the additional prosecutions that will come from it due to non-payment of the fixed penalty notices. Um, so it's envisaged that as a minimum, you'll, we'll, we'll probably get sort of 700 or so prosecutions for, for breaches of the PSPO over the, over the 12 months. Um, and currently, there isn't the sort of resource in legal services to take on those cases. Um, so we're in conversations with them on how we can um, sort that, that problem out. Um, and they're in conversations with the courts to, to ensure there's slots available for the, to hear the cases. Um, that's, sorry, that's sort of local authority support. Um, brief sort of overview where we are. Um, and then general sort of waste team enforcement that we're looking at doing once lockdown um, eases in April all the businesses are going to open and, and we had quite a lot of issues last time with with businesses opening um, and because they cancelled waste contracts at the start of lockdown um, they then opened up and I think in the euphoria of opening up a lot of them forgot to actually phone the companies up to make sure that they were going to collect their bins um, which meant we had overflowing bins bags sort of left outside businesses awaiting collection for days, um, which everyone knows leads to more litter and, and generally the the sort of street scene not looking particularly pleasant. Um, so some work that Amy and I will undertake is going to inspect, proactively sort of start inspecting the premises, uh, make sure that they are complying with the legislation um, and the way it will work, we, we're not going to sort of go in heavy handed. Um, it will be a warning first and businesses will be given some time to um, sort themselves out and get things organised. Um, and then if there's any further issues, we'll then look to sort of take further action, which will be serving notices and hopefully not. But in some cases, maybe having to issue fixed penalty notices for breach of the notices that we've issued. Um, this work sort of follows on from a flyer we sent out with all the business rates letters, um, which was just sort of a, a friendly nudge, asking them, just telling businesses of their requirements and, and their responsibilities with waste. Um, so it sort of moves on from that to, to more hands-on enforcement. Um, and, and like I say, hopefully most businesses are complying and and the ones that aren't, it will be a it will be a sort of a more of a educational visit saying that what they need to do um, and it will hopefully preempt some of the issues. So there won't be as many issues in our town centres and, and public places. Um, and then finally, just wanted to yeah bring your attention to a couple of flight tipping prosecutions we've had towards the end of 
last year Rick, at the beginning Rick, of this Chris, year. Chris, can I just Chris, interrupt you a second? The, yeah, I'm, not I'm not sure what it sure for other people, but I, the, I'm still on the PSPO enforcement slide. It hasn't moved on for me, but I'm not sure about others. I've been, listening, listening to, I've been listening to what Same you've been here. saying, um, and that, which has been fine, yeah, but just, to just, just the flag no, that you the, the, the slides are... Screen, then reshare your screen and then it will appear. Give me a second. Is that better? Can everyone see that? Just take it's coming, seconds. sure it's coming, yeah. Here we go. Yeah, so that's a different slide now. Waste enforcement team working, yeah. Yeah. With businesses, um, yeah. So yeah, that's the sort of businesses, business enforcement that I was talking about. The, pro the um, proactive work, yeah. Yeah, so, so it's a bit of a change. We generally have just sort of dealt with complaints in the past, but um, over the summer, we are going to sort of step up more the proactive stuff to try and preempt some of the issues that we get um, as much as our resource allows. Um, and then hopefully it's moved on to fly tipping prosecutions. Um, but yes, we had we had one at the end of last year yeah, where it, ha it hasn't actually it hasn't for me. It's stuck again. <laughs> yeah, this is the last slide, so um, <laughs> that's okay. It happens. That should load up now. Is that loaded? Not yet, but I'm sure it's there. There you go. Yep. Perfect. Um, so yeah, this couple of prosecutions we had sort of towards the end of last year and the beginning of this year for fly tipping. It hasn't. Um, it hasn't loaded for me uh, yet. It has. Yeah. It has for me. Yeah, it's just a lag, John. I'm afraid it, it's for most of us. It has, but you'll you'll get it. Who are you calling a lag? <laughs> uh chris carry, yeah, carry on chris <laughs> that's fine um so yeah so one was um the the gentleman from from bristol um it was around sort of fly five fly tips in dundry and abbots lee they they did with his with his mate with their van um and he got around six thousand pound fine and, and a suspended sentence and um a couple of hundred hours unpaid work and then um, in February this year, we also had another one where um, the, another Bristol man was um, caught by our sort of CCTV enforcement cameras on, on Yandley Lane. Um, and that amounted to about £1,100 worth of costs and fines that he had to pay. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we'll have, a, we'll have a few more over the next few months as well. So um, that's what the prosecutions for fly tipping have um, increased and are, are looking at. Um, and then hopefully it's gone on. It doesn't matter. It's only questions. The, la the last slide. So um, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, Terry. Yeah, um, we got in Hutton. We've got a couple of places where they continually tip every few weeks. And I've asked for cameras to be put in there. We've not seen any response yet. I've been in touch with the team a few times for that because yeah, I think it would be worthwhile uh, doing it. But I'm told. If there's a large footfall, they won't do it because they activate too often. I don't know what your thoughts are on it. Yeah, so the the cameras that we've got um, are, are sort of they're fairly cheap cameras compared to what you can pay for. Um, they're they're sort of wildlife cameras, so they work on the basis that movement triggers them to start filming or taking photographs, um, and yeah the, they're not ideal in high sort of footfall places because there's an sd card in them that just gets clogged up with lots of people going for their daily walks instead of people actually fly tipping um so yeah unfortunately that's they're only useful in sort of very rural areas where you don't get a lot of footfall um or where council officers can go out and, and change the batteries and the sd cards every couple of days which um at the moment isn't isn't possible with the resource we've got um we potentially in the future will look to getting sort of probably better cameras but they're thousands of pounds not 150 pounds per camera 
um, but they do work on the on a battery pack and and sort of can upload video straight to a straight to a cloud where they can be viewed. You know, I, I've got your wildlife ones, and I accept they won't work. But to be honest, if you look at what it's costing you to come out all the time with lorries and pick it up, and every couple of weeks the same thing, you know, surely there must be a cost benefit in coming out and buying some of these other cameras to at least try and prevent it. If not, stick a false looking one up with some signs so that it'll keep the people away from Hutton anyway. That would be the idea. <laughs> Yeah, so we're willing to look at, at places for cameras, and that is something that local authority support might be able to help with as well. Um, well they have. Good. I've been through to there, and I'll, I'll chase them again. So yeah, they've had, they've got cameras that sort of work on the basis of um, AMPR, and and they're much sort of yeah, much more expensive, but also better than the cameras that that we use. Um, so with that contract, there is the potential that we can tag on to, to their work with the CCTV cameras. Um, and and that can be on sort of more or less a cost neutral basis as long as we get the fixed penalty notices for the for the catching people fly tipping or or breaking the PSPO. Um, so yeah, we will hopefully improve that once local authority support come in. Um, and yeah, like I said, happy to look at areas, but unfortunately the cameras we've got aren't perfect they work in some areas and they don't in others thanks chris thanks terry uh catch the james hugh thank you very much um yeah i really welcome the list of enforcement and sort of fly tipping enforcement um in port said we've just had the ports a bit clean and um it's, it's amazing how much litter accumulates and if there's an, if there could be any camera around the marina looking at serial litter is there that would be useful but um i appreciate you'll probably have half the town um <laughs> uh in terms of port's head uh there's um there have been commercial waste problems and i've sent a letter to a business that's been a serial um litterer with its blue um disposable gloves that they use for petrol um and they didn't respond to me so then we tidied it up so is there a is would it, that go to you if i wanted to actually kept the supermarket to reply to uh, uh, basically wasn't able to get any response from them when we said, by the way, this is a problem. Could you do something about it? So is that something that can be done, commercial enforcement like that? Yeah, so so businesses have to responsibly deal with their waste, and that includes keeping the area around their business free of litter. If it's come from their business, um, they have a responsibility for it. So if it's the blue gloves from sort of a petrol station, um, I'm assuming they're dropped on the floor and it's sort of wind blown out. I assume so, yeah. Sort of um, so that's definitely something we can deal with. So yeah, send it through and we'll Very have a look well, at it. Do that. And the other thing I wanted to bring up is um, in the executive meeting, there was a concern raised by some members about um, uh, these PSP, I, I've done the acronym wrong, but PSPOs and aggressive begging. And my concern was uh the potential for young people to be pushed out of the only spaces in which they're welcome which is open public spaces um in terms of some of the ps uh some of the public space protection orders we've got um i think that we've got great offices but just wondered because that was entirely a member-led conversation you could reassure us a bit that you know that um that we wouldn't aggressively target um uh street beggars and uh, or young people in in using our PSPOs, and it will be proportionate. So who wants to take that one? Uh, yeah, do you want me to take that one? Um, so we sure. we were following and sort of kept up to speed with the conversations that went went on in the executive and um, and the other council meetings, and for particularly for aggressive begging and a couple of other of the PSPOs, some more work is being done on them just to make sure that we've got the a really good procedure of how to deal with tricky issues actually in town centres and when the appropriate time is to use the right enforcement and when other methods are going to, going to better deal with some of the issues that we come across. So I think in terms of Chris's world and the 
application of sort of environmental legislation. We generally don't target people under 18 apart from for some education anyway. Um, when we do deal with young people, we do take into account the circumstances um, and we, we, we sort of we, we try to take an educational approach, but obviously some of the things that Chris deals with are persistent fly tipping, and we don't want to be kind to people that do that, really. <laughs> we want to deal with it. But when it comes to littering, and we've we spent quite a lot of time with um, with local authority support, and we'll continue to do so, just making sure that the actions we take are proportionate. But I take your point about this, particularly about aggressive begging and some of the, those other issues. While the PSPO is there to provide our way of doing enforcement, that's not the way that we tackle those issues. So we've just gone off to do a bit more work to make sure that that's absolutely clear before we go ahead with um, with bringing some of those things in. That's really reassuring. Thank you both. Thanks to you. Thanks, Gemma. Um, I've got uh, Jill, Caps of Butte, and then uh, Peter Crew. Jill. Um, okay. Well, my my sort of question, as well, question request, I suppose, is about something which has increased dramatically um, since the lockdown last year, and that's uh, dog poo, which is affecting every single village and road and street throughout the whole of the district, Western Supermare, and the whole of North Somerset. Um, and it's just constant complaints um, and people put posts on about um, dog poo trees, which is even worse with the irresponsible dog owners. And what is even worse is that, that instead of leaving the dog poo, that's bad enough, but to actually then bag it and put it in somebody's hedge or hang it on tree branches is absolutely and utterly disgusting. Um, it's very difficult to know what to do about this. And I can understand that it's exceptionally difficult. What's the solution? And I just wondered if there was any way that we could have a campaign of pushing, you know, sign. I know there are some signs on lampposts because I see them when I'm out with my dogs. But could there be an even greater push on having more warning signs on lampposts or something? It's, it's incredibly difficult, but it affects every single one of us. Um, when we're out walking, it's more of a question, a request. What can we do? Thanks, Jill. So, yeah, with, with dog fouling, we can obviously we can include more signs around the area. Um, as far as the PSPO enforcement goes, it's on there and all the authorised council officers, whilst they're out doing their work, can can issue the um, fixed penalty notice and follow that process. Um, local or local authority support, um, there's sort of between four and six of their staff members that are on the contract. Um, and they, yeah, they won't just be sticking to sort of your, your standard sort of seafront areas. They will be able to be requested to go around um, areas that are sort of heavy dog walker traffic areas. Um, and effectively it is difficult because you have to see it being sort of done and, and the person walk off. Um, but as far as that goes, that's sort of how we can deal with that under the PSPO. If it's, if it's seen, we can find people for it. Um, happy to put more signage up. And, and yeah, dog poo trees are sort of bizarre behaviour, aren't they? I, I never quite understand it. Um, but we can we can get them cleared up by our by our street cleansing contractor if, if needed, if there is particularly um, bad areas. Um, but like I said, just if you if people can report it, we know it's there. That's I think that's the main issue. Often people see things and, and don't report them. And no. then we sort of find no. out further down the line. But um, yeah, I think we're we will be in favor. You know, we want the me the messaging we want to go out is that it's zero tolerance, isn't it? So yeah. if you are if you are, and that includes that I think that important note about not being able to produce a poo bag if if you are confronted. I mean, I think it, I've got dogs. I think in ten years I've probably f forgotten a poo bag once. I was horrified and had to sort of go back <laughs> a, a, after myself later. You know, it's not it's not difficult, mm. um, and that's the message we need to get out. So I, I, yeah, I'd be in favour of more stickers and things as well jill okay. right i've got a i've got um catch the crew and then i've got uh catch the uh, lay morgan and then uh john cato uh peter thank you chairman i'll pick up on two or three things as uh chairman of community safety 
but first of all, the mention of CCTV cameras. Actually, the sense would be, with the new system we have in place, would be to cover things like that, which is why Western Town Council purchased two mobile cameras. And it suddenly occurred to me that maybe, uh, with the cost of cameras, town councils could purchase one. I know, of course, they were interested when we discussed it, but also it could be two or three parishes getting together to buy one to cover things like this. But if we go on to public space protection orders, if we look at uh, the aggressive begging, yes, we've always been conscious. Some people confuse homeless people with begging. There is aggressive begging and people that need help. We've always been in a position of helping those people that need help. We've, we've helped them, we've spoken to them and helped. But let's not get away from the fact of, I quote the famous one, of the two 17-year-olds that were aggressively begging in Western High Street, making over £300, sometimes in a day, and living in an eight-bedroom house. So we do have to be mindful of that, but at the same time be uh, very cautious of it. In terms of dog fouling, we, we did an experiment uh, two, three years back, and we, we actually had a, a problem area, which in the end, we did do a couple of uh, issuing of notices, but we ended up putting a notice up on the lamppost. And that had an effect of reducing it dramatically. But what we said in the recent round is until we know we're in a position that we can police it, there is no point in putting signage up. But if we now find we're in a position where we're extending the ability to police public space protection orders, then we can start looking again at having signage which is in the right places because that will be a deterrent. But also for those people that are persistent, it means there's a chance they are going to get caught. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Peter. That's um, we'll move straight on. I think thanks for those points, Peter. I, I agree. Uh, Councillor Lay Morgan, John. Thank you, Chairman. I think that we're approaching the whole thing of dog fouling from totally the wrong angle. I mean, this is not a problem that is unique to North Somerset. It is nationwide, and the uh, chief. Uh, people responsible are for those who they're not proper dog uh, lovers. They probably take them out under the cover of darkness. They walk them 50 yards up the road and they walk them 50 yards back again. And that's the only outing the dog gets. He's done his business and it's been done under the cover of darkness. So it's not been seen. What is needed is a nationwide uh, um, uh, DNA um, bank. Dog owners being required to have their dog's DNA uh, uh, recorded so that any piece of dog mess which is left behind can be tested and referred to back to the bank. I think that once, you know, we've given six months or so to, to get people uh, to join up, the, the, the fact that they have uh, had their dog uh, tested and identified would be denoted by a special uh, disc on the collar or something like that. And if people know that the, whatever they do, wherever they do it, uh, they're going to get caught. And I would, just, I, I would just, uh, cheerfully bet that it would resolve the matter throughout the country overnight. But it's got to be done at government level, not us uh, yeah. putting piddly little notices. These people who are responsible for allowing their dogs to foul, they know full well that they shouldn't be doing it. But they're just giving two fingers uh, to, uh, to the rest of us. Thank you, John, for that. You need to write to John Penrose, I think, about, about that one. <laughs> Noted. Thank, thank you, John. Uh, John. John Cato, Councillor Cato. Um, just a, a, a question. I don't understand whether there's any, uh, in terms of reporting dog fouling and, in fact, other situations like this, um, whether or not there's any um, facility for residents to report um, and just taking it logically, um, if there was such a facility, presumably you need evidence 
uh, therefore, you know, a camera like on your phone and uh, some kind of reporting app. Um, is this crazy? Is it um, logical? I don't know. I'm just opening up for your comment. I think you could put yourself at personal risk if you're going to start taking a picture of somebody who's not picking up dog poo. <laughs> I mean, at the moment, I, I tend to approach them and say, oh, are you, you know, do you need a dog poo bag? You, you've um, forgotten, yes. Um, and usually that causes a sheepish kind of movement. And uh, yeah, anyway. Mm. I... I, I'm conscious we we probably need to begin to move on. We want to get to Cardinal Way. So I, I, I suppose, you know, I, I, I'm not sure we can, we've obviously got the new local authority um, services coming on board, but I, I, obviously even their resources, it, it's not huge, is it? I think my question would be, you know, are we prepared? Should we get a reoccurrence of the, my main concern really at the beginning of the conversation was, are we, are we prepared? Should we get a reoccurrence of the littering um, epidemic, if I could use that word, uh, that we had last year? And I think we've probably got a partial, a, a partial response, but you know we we just probably don't have the resources um, to give a full one. But there are certainly some things I'm sure that we saw saw last year that we would be able. You know, we created some. Uh, we had more bins, didn't we? We had we had banners, we had signage. You know, there was a lot of social media. Um, I just hope um that things will be better this time but i'm quite fearful that it, it will be a, a repeat Gemma. um yeah i think that we all recognize that this summer will be particularly challenging for littering and quite a lot of other um things that happen outside and in the environment particularly with the stages of the coming out of the lockdown there's various periods where things can be open but indoor toilets in premises won't be open at the same time or people can do things outside but there'll be a lot of pressure on the um our litter teams so we are working with um colleagues and the executive to see whether we can put something additional in place to help us deal with these issues so we're hoping over the next couple of weeks to, so you're right that having enforcement is part of the puzzle but it's not the whole thing we're going to be under more pressure than ever um, so we're, we're just thinking about, for, so for example, an extra crew to work weekends um, to be able to pick up overflowing litter bins or put extra bins out at key hotspots at weekends. That's something that we're looking at and costing up and seeing how much that would be just to help us cope with this spring and summer. So I think we can keep scrutiny informed of the progress of that. But like you, we recognise that it was a problem last year and it's likely to be more of a problem. And there's more what we class as dangerous litter, so broken glass and things that can sort of hurt children and hurt people's dogs and the, in beauty spots um, from outdoor parties and things. So we, ju we just we're aware of it and we're trying to think about what we can usefully do this year, maybe as an exception to deal with it. Thanks, Joe. I think probably it'd be something useful. You know, we get the regular stakeholder updates don't we all elected members do we we might have a future webinar uh, obviously exec members will probably get asked this sort of thing in in the facebook q and a's i think it's probably something that all all members actually would welcome some kind of update in, in due course about the kind of things we're disc you know about how we're how we're facing up to as i say as as uh, lockdown is, is is relaxed um John, is, is yours a quick quick point you wanted to, to make? It certainly is, yes. Uh, a few days ago, I had an email from my brother-in-law who was pointed out... It doesn't sound uh, like a quick point, John. <laughs> no, carry, carry on, carry on. Who pointed out that uh, bins are overflowing uh, on Clevedon Seafront and also on Port, uh, Porter's Head uh, quite early in the day. And even when they're emptied, mid-morning they're overflowing again by lunchtime and it seems that the, the the problem is that these are still small bins that we used to have on the seafront at western once they were replaced by large wheelie bins the problem was largely solved at western and he was simply asking that why aren't same bins being deployed elsewhere Ooh. 
Thanks, John. I think Gemma, do you want to come back on that one? Or, or? Uh, I'm going to see if it, if Colin's still on the call because I think he could probably give a better response on that. But if he's not, I will give it a go. No, I'm, 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 I'm here, Gemma. Here he's, I am. He's, here. Here he's I am. primed for the next um, item. Yes, <laughs> Colin. Indeed, I hope I hope so. Anyway, um, yeah. So on on the bins, um, we we did put some bigger bins out at um, at Clevedon last year at Salt House Fields. Um, and as Gemma explained earlier, what we're planning to do is is having a, an additional resource um, that's out. So some of the issues they are during the morning, but bins tend to be serviced during the morning. It's also the afternoon, and in in particular around the uh, or over the weekends. So the plan will be to have a couple of additional crews and for those crews to work later on in the day. So um, 12 noon until 8 p.m. And for those crews to be working. So both crews would actually be working over the weekend, which is, again, tends to be the um, the busiest time. So I think, again, based on last year's experience, um, that's that's what we're planning to do. And, and we're you know, fairly confident that that will resolve the issue. So. Those crews would be um, working at Clevedon and they'd also be working around Portis Head. So two areas that we was aware from last year was causing um, issues. But can you confirm, Colin, that bigger bins will be provided? Because clearly my intelligence was and, and my brother-in-law was uh, speaking, having just come back from Clevedon, that these are small, too small to be worthwhile. Yeah, so so the bins that are that were at Western, quite rightly, along the seafront were very small. They was about 60 litres um, and they've been increased in, in size. And um, the ones that are at Clevedon and, and at um, Portishead, Head or mainly at Portishead, Head are, are the larger ones. So the, the, one, the, the big ones that you're referring to at Western are, are collected by um, a, a waste collection vehicle. So from a manual handling point of view, they're hooked onto the vehicle and then um, offloaded. Whereas the ones at um, Portis Head and the ones at Clevedon have to be manually lifted and put in the vehicle. Um, so the whole thing about what resource do we have, we don't have the resource with, with actual vehicles as well to be able to do that. Um, as in to actually lift the bins up and to tip them into the vehicle. So we are restricted on that. So um, I think what we're planning, John, will will relieve that problem. I'm sure it will. Thank, thank you. you very much, Colin. Thank, thank, thanks, John. Hugh, you had a yeah, quick point. So, so just to back up what John's saying about uh, the bins around the arena, but uh, from a different sort of angle, um, yesterday, uh, not yes, in the weekend, uh, we cleaned up the area around one bin and it was four bags worth uh, around the bin itself rather than in the bin. Um, but the question really was, I know there's some licensing applications at the moment coming in about uh, more food vendors around the marina. Um, do you know if uh, those sort of applications and uh, the businesses nearby, do, do they pay some sort of fee or charge to accommodate for the huge amount of collections that are needed to accommodate for them? Is there some sort of extra charge around that or is that just what you would expect from the business but from you know general fees so i'm um, gone Gemma. you you've got your microphone primed yeah i, I was going to say that we can find that out rather than give an accurate response now i'm just i'm not entirely Sorry, sure yeah. how the <laughs> structure works so we can we can certainly come back on that one for you here cheers Thanks, you. Right, let's let's move on to to garden waste. I know that um, we've got Lizzie and wait Lizzie on the call. Uh, Lizzie and Colin between you. I think Lizzie, you've got a, a few slides. Probably give us a bit of an update on where we are, given that we we launched the new service, or in terms of the sign up anyway, on, on on Monday. I just just as a quick preamble to this, I did want to say that. In terms of, of 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 scrutiny, anyway, that I probably say up front that the recommendation of, of of scrutiny. I think we were we were keen. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, colleagues. We were keen for a ten pound discount for those who are currently signed up to the service. So we we've ended up obviously up with a with a ten percent 
uh, early bird discount, a five pound early bird discount, um, if you sign up to these new service by the twenty eighth of, of this month. I mean, I, I understand, uh, you know how how we've got to where we've we've got to, and I've I've seen the financial modelling; it just didn't kind of work. But I did want to make that um, clear up front, um, and also that certainly having seen a lot of the the conversations on, dare I say, it, you know, Facebook but not just Facebook, people I speak to as well, that in terms of the, this perception that people have that they've uh, that they paid £25 or in the very early days, I think it was 20 wasn't it? But £25, they think they paid for the bin. And, of course, you know, perception is quite often what nine-tenths of their reality, isn't it? And I looked at the terms and conditions. I looked at the original... Um, Council papers, um, Peter, Councillor Crew, you'll, you'll recall, it clearly states people are, are paying to sign up to the service, not for the bin, that the terms and conditions certainly say people are signing up to the service. I think what but we also, I think, have to sort of recognise that um, we probably haven't been as clear as we, we perhaps could have been. And, and, and some of that has somehow been lost in the small print because it has been in the small print. And I'm just looking at some of the some of the headta- headlines in the newspaper in the in the press this week. It you know continually refers to um, a fifty pound charge per bin, you know, um, which rather than signing up to the service. So I still think we've got a little bit of work to do. I mean, I received my letter um, today, and I think it's great. I think the tone is I think it's brilliant, and and it, it obviously comes with a composting leaflet. And we'll hear about that in a minute, I think. But but um, as I say, we we're bound to get a lot of negativity. Um, but I think I know the team have worked extremely hard, and, and you know, scrutiny have worked you know very closely uh, along the way. Um, but I'll leave it with there. I'm sure members have questions, but let's let's have some officers. To, let's hear from officers first. Um, Lizzie, do you do you want to bring up one or two slides? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to put up a few slides and hopefully the technology will work. Yeah, looks good to me, Lizzie. Can people see the... the uh, yeah. What you should be able to see is our garden waste logo, essentially. It's a piece of the branding that should match with some of the publicity around the... Um, publicity around composting and the artwork that's going on all the bins and things we're we've created a a a brand as it were for the new garden waste service um what i wanted to do was to you've kind of given us a, a very good introduction so what i did want to do was just to share kind of where we are with the communications that has happened so far and then give you some of the figures for sort of um the communications that we've had and then kind of look at where we're going forwards next. Um, so councillors you will be aware that you should have received um, an email from Bridget on Thursday night last week which um, I hope answered many of your questions and has been useful to you um, in answering some of the resident inquiries that you may have come across. Um, A similar email went to Town and Parish Councils as well to provide them with information. And um, uh, this week we have also contacted some of the managing agents of flat blocks um, to do similar, share the information more widely with them. North Somerset Life, the eLife newsletter went out on Friday night. Um, And from that, we had nearly 17,000 clicks through to the waste and recycling pages of the website. Um, This is a really good way to contact our residents, some of the keen ones anyway. Um, And then as of this week, Monday morning was the 1st of of March when the new service went live. The web pages were published with the new service information, um, including the reduction of the home compost bins from £15 to £10 um, and the new sign up forms were due to go live. We did have some technical difficulties. Um, I myself and other waste colleagues who live in the area did 
have a go at testing the pages and register or sign up ourselves um, around about 3 p.m. And they were working. Um, we did were aware that there were also some um, problems with the uh, contact centre being able to take payments over the phone. So we did receive um, a number of sort of comments and um, queries relating to that. Uh, the council tax information for those residents who are on very low incomes, who are receiving a discount on their garden waste collection service, which is the same as the discount they receive off their council tax. That information was loaded into the system and available from Wednesday morning. And as of last night, the contact centre payment issues with Civica Pay um, was all resolved and the contact centre have been able to take payments um, from today with no problems. Um, we are we have been dealing with a few inquiries relating to errors occurring with payments and incorrect prices. Um, we the team are working really, really hard to respond to everyone's inquiries. Um, and we have um, made some changes to the wording on the website following some of the resident feedback and um, councillor feedback as well. Um, thank you for everyone who has contributed so far. If there are um, questions that you are regularly getting asked, um, we would like to know um, if the FAQs aren't answering your questions um, so that we can obviously update those for you. The common themes in the comments and inquiries that we've had, um, apart from sort of issues with payments around residents having concerns about potentially more fly tipping of garden waste and um, people burning their garden waste as an alternative form of disposal. Um, that is answered by the FAQs. Um, in particular, fly tipping and bonfires haven't been seen to rise by other local authorities that have introduced the charge. Over two thirds of other local authorities do charge for their garden waste collections. Um, so we aren't by any means an unusual authority to do this. Um, and we have great feedback from those authorities that they haven't seen arise, um, particularly around fly tipping, because if people are going to put it into the back of their cars and take it somewhere, they might as well take it to a recycling centre because that is still free. Um, there were some inquiries and things. We've had a fair few comments around people just generally disagreeing with the additional charge. Um, people believing that they pay for it out of their council tax and things. Um, but again, this is answered by the FAQs. Um, we have had a number of questions, probably I would say one of the highest number of people asking how they would like to um, return their unwanted garden waste bin to us um, as they choose not to sign up to the service. We have held off on telling people that um, we are going to collect unwanted garden waste bins in straight away. This is primarily because actually we don't want to resource, put a resource into collecting a bin that someone will take their garden waste to the recycling centre for maybe two or three weeks um, and then potentially change their mind. It, that would be an expensive thing to collect a bin in only to have to re-deliver it again in two weeks time. It's also a faff for the resident. Um, we have a number of different options of different ways of how to do this later on in the year, but we will let people know later in the year how we'll do it. Um, again, lots of questions about how the service will work answered by the frequently asked questions and some of the issues with the payments that we're still working on. Um, so uh, just to update you on the numbers, as of yesterday night, we had nearly three and a half thousand people had signed up to the new garden waste service we'd actually had 358 new compost bins ordered to put that into context in the whole of 2019 we only had 225 compost bins ordered in the entire year and and that 358 compost bins is just um since the weekend the home composting webpage had 438 views on it, and this was as of Tuesday. We're currently running up about 150 emails to the garden waste inbox 
um, currently unviewed and unresponded to. Um, it's pretty much nearly 100 a day, I think, now. Um, the Garden Waste webpage views, again, nearly three and a half thousand. And the My Account new container form pages where you can um, order new containers, so not just garden waste bins, but recycling receptacles and things. We've seen an upsurge. That's 9,000 page views. These are individual page views. Some people will have viewed the page more than once. Um, since Monday, we've also five of the top 10 web pages viewed were related to waste. And the contact centre have received an increasing number of telephone calls. Monday, just under 400. Tuesday, 450. Wednesday, seven, just over 700. So the calls have been going up. Um, and we do have some stats from the contact centre for the call waiting times, which are above average. Um, so we are aware that people are are waiting a bit longer. Um, the advice is obviously the quickest way to do it is online if you can. Um, if you can't do it online, please bear with us. We will take your calls and you are able to pay over the telephone. And then hopefully you can still see this. Um, the next steps in garden waste is in terms of the communications that are going out to residents, we have a bin hanger um, going out on all the garden waste bins from next week for anyone who puts out a garden waste bin for collection, just as a reminder. Um, and then towards the middle of the month, towards the end of the month, anyone who has um, signed up and paid we'll start posting out their confirmation letters with their bin permit. It's a sticker for bins or a loopy tag for those who are on garden waste sack collections. Um, there is another issue of eLife going out at the end of the month, which um, will include a reminder with the early bird discount deadline drawing near. And then from the 29th of March, the early bird discount closes and um, each sign up will be full price. And then for the 1st of April, the new service will commence. Um, all garden waste bins presented initially will get collected um, and then uh, everyone will receive an oops hanger if they have not paid um, as a reminder and it will let them know that we will no longer be collecting garden waste bins that haven't been paid for. Um, I'm going to hopefully let's just stop, stop sharing that screen and I would uh, welcome questions. I'm sure there are a few. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. Um, there aren't that many actually at the moment. Uh, Councillor Lee Morgan, John. Thank you. Uh, Lizzie, may I, just in case it's not amongst the frequently asked questions, could I ask, uh, is there any information being published about the dimensions of the composters, uh, composting boxes? So that, because for some people of may course, be wondering they... whether they've got room or not for, for one. Absolutely. Um, the dimensions of the compost bin were not published with the leaflet. I do have a template email that I have been responding to residents with, which contains a photograph and the full specification, including all of the dimensions. I, um, if anyone would like to have that as a template, I'm more than happy to share it. Otherwise, um, I can pass on the information as needed. I think John John probably would. Thanks. Thank you, John. Thanks, Lizzie. Uh, I shall I have... email you, John. Counts. Thanks, Lizzie. Councillor Thank Payne, Robert, and then uh, Councillor Treadaway, uh, Stuart after Robert. Robert. Um, yeah, thank you. Can, can you tell me um, the letters that have been issued to people on the existing scheme? Are they have they all gone out or when when will they be complete? When will they finish being sent out? And uh, a second question, um, what is the purpose of the, um, the, the 
permit sticker on the bin. I don't really understand what what is for. And if somebody doesn't stick it on their bin, uh, but they've signed up for the scheme, will it will it make any difference? Yes, it will. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. So yeah. I'll take the first question first, which is around the letters and the posting out of the letters. They were at the print house to go out uh, from Monday, and they uh, should all be delivered by the end of this week. Um, I live in I live in Yatton and um, have not yet received my letter. I know, Steve, um, you say that you might have got yours today. I don't believe I've checked yeah. my post yet. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do today, realize yeah. that uh, not everyone has got their letter yet, but they should have them by the end of the week. Um, in terms of the purpose of the permit, either stickers for a wheelie bin or a tag for garden waste sacks, um, it is so that the crew can clearly and easily identify which bins have been paid for quickly. The crew will also have the addresses on their in-cab devices, which is where they log if a bin is not out for collection or if the bin contains wrong items or if, it, like, for example, the bin um, accidentally ended up in the back of the, the collection vehicle. Um, they can log all these kind of service issues on on this device and it does have their route and their bins that they're supposed to be collecting. Um, but we would hope that residents would present their permit. It shows that they've paid. It gives them something um, for their money. Um, in particular, obviously, we're introducing a chargeable service where residents already have existing containers. So some might feel like they're not getting a lot for the money that we're now asking them for. Um, it helps to sort of recognise that they've paid for a service. The enclosing letter with the permit um, is a good reminder for them about what they can and can't place within the garden waste bin and how to use the service as best as possible and how to make the most of their, you know, the money that they're paying, really. So if a bin, if a resident pays for the service and chooses not to stick the permit on the bin I would say that their crew have the log that the address is signed up and paid for but there is a risk that the bin may not be collected on the first occasion purely and simply because the crew haven't seen the easily identifiable tag upon the bin. Yep uh, thanks Thank I think that seems clear. Uh, thanks, Lizzie. Uh, Stuart Treadway, then, then, then John Cato, and then and, um, happy for you to come in, um, Bridget, set, set member. Um, Stuart. Thanks. Um, Lizzie, I, 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 just coincidentally today, I, I had a call from a resident who was struggling to get through um, regarding the, 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 the green bins and composting bins. Um, I mean, I told her that I, sh I imagined it was just high volume and, and to try again later. But, but I thought you'd appreciate to, I mean, given that we, we're discussing it now, you'd appreciate to, to hear that. Uh, yeah, thank you, Stuart. Um, we have, there is money in the budget for additional support for two additional officers for the contact centre um, to, to help them with manage the high volumes of, of calls that they will be getting. Uh, it's my understanding that they are going to be employing these members of staff from next week. Um, so that should help. Oh, right. That's that's good to hear. Thanks. Thanks. That is good to know. Uh, Coach the Cato, John. Uh, hello, yeah, thank you. Um, Disappointed, Lizzie, to hear that they're not going to be handling the call centre before next week, given that we've just gone public and made it you know, now is the time really when it needs to be there. So I don't know if anything can be done on that. That's an aside because I've had problems too. Um, on the website, um, I've given some feedback on the website. I wonder if uh, how I'd go about giving some more feedback on the website because it still feels to me from a usability point of view. Um, uh, it need, would need some extra support. So how would I do that, please? Direct to you, Lizzie. Colin. Thank you, John. Um, 
Yes, thank you, John. Um, I have um, been speaking with Ness in our communications team, who I know she spoke extensively with you around that and the feedback that you gave was brilliant. So thank you for that. We we do really appreciate it. Um, if if thank you, you have further um, feedback to, to give, yes, please, we would welcome that. Um, you can speak to, to Ness direct or you can come direct to myself. Um, we can both happy to happy to work with you on that to make improvements and make it more accessible for sure. Um, on, on the contact centre, um, on, on your concerns about that, they are taking phone calls from residents and they are taking payments as of this morning. It's working um, working very well. It is just that there are high volumes of calls. So the call waiting times are around about 10 minutes long at the moment, um, looking at the looking at the stats that were sent through. Um, so perhaps yes, and, and hopefully with the new staff coming in, um, that should reduce the wait times next week. So yeah, so appreciate that, Lizzie. Just if there was anything that one could do to handle the higher call volume now, I'm sure that would be a helpful. I was picking up what Stuart said, and I personally have also tried making a phone call through and got uh, great difficulty in getting through so in the normal channel. You know, the proper number. Thanks for that, Lizzie. I'll be in touch with you later as well. Noted. Thanks. Thanks, John. I, we rather passed over it, but um, one, I think it's important to note that 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 really good response, Lizzie, to the um, request for compost bins. That's that's a that's a real positive, isn't it? Um, and, and it's still early days, so that's that's great. Uh, Br Bridget, Councillor Petty, Exec Member, Bridget. Um, so yeah, I think that, like you just said, uh, Steve, there are. Um, it's fantastic to hear that we have um, more than 300 people, I think it's closer to 400, already signed up for compost bins. That's the result that we would like to see. We would like to see people spending their time putting their garden waste into the compost and, and seeing that cycle and, and ending up with a, with a free compost to go on their gardens. So I think, you know, I, I guess through the num number of months and almost more than a year of talking about this, I hoped that it would pr prompt composting, but I had a fear that it was just about charging 45 or 50 pounds. So to hear that this week we have already had quite a high volume is a really fantastic thing. And, and the hard work of the waste team in promoting that, making sure there's good information on the website and really um, marketing that as a really good uh, option and having that as a discount. I think that, that that's a credit to the team. And I do know that the team have worked really hard and they've taken the feedback from John Cato, from other councillors on the frequently asked questions and the tone of the letter. Um, so I would like to applaud the, the hard work on that. I have had struggles in the past couple of days to hear that things are not working as smoothly as anticipated. And I, I'm going to use it. I am disappointed that things haven't gone as smoothly. But I do know that all the team have been committed to trying to find solutions as quickly as possible. Uh, and I've been on the phone to Colin and Lizzie plenty every couple of hours on is it updated? Is it improved? Is it working? So I also have had a couple of phone calls and conversations with residents in the street who have said, I'm happy to pay. I'm all right with this. This is good value for money to me. Did anybody really think £25 was this is what somebody said to me this morning was, did somebody really think £25 was going to last them years and years and years to get something collected? So just to put the other spin on it, it is not 100 percent negative that I am receiving from my residents about paying for this service. So the work done on tone, on messaging and on understanding the important challenge of finances that North Somerset is facing, I think, is going well. Um, I wanted to I think actually I wanted to ask Lizzie on the average number of calls we get to the call centre a day on a normal day versus what they're experiencing now. And I was going to ask about waiting times, but the waiting times, I feel like you answered that with with John Cato. So, um, yeah, I just do want to thank everybody for the hard work they've done. And I understand that not everybody's got their letters, but the letter hit back well at nine o'clock um, in the morning on on Monday, which is why when the website didn't work straight away, it was fairly frustrating. But it's good to see that problems are being solved quickly. And I think that the work I'll do with John Cato and, and Lizzie and the waste team to make sure that those frequently asked questions are there, the tone and the language is there, and it's the most usable um, and, and friendly to find, click and sign up are all things that we need to continue to address. Um, 
but uh, hopefully this is all positive steps in the right direction. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bridget. Uh, any other questions from members? I, keep, I can't see any. We've had all our questions answered. Satisfactory, I think. I, I, I'd like to say again, I think the, the letter, and, I, and yes, I received mine uh, only today, you know, I think is, it, it is upfront. I think the, you know, the, the, the first uh, paragraph of the letter, you know, says it already, while it's understandably frustrating to be asked to pay for a service you were previously receiving for no additional charge, we've been forced to make tough decisions about where we make savings as council finances are under a great deal of pressure. And that's that's it in a nutshell, really. Um, thank you. I can't see any more questions. So uh, thank you very much, Lizzie. Really appreciate that. Thank you. And, uh, and Colin and Gemma. And I think we can then move on to the last agenda thank item. Thank you at um, 4.25, which is the uh, work plan. Uh, Philippa, do you want to kick us off on this one, please? Yes, certainly. Um, I think I'm firstly pleased to say the work plan process is obviously working well because just about everything that's on the work plan we are indeed covering. So there's been progress <laughs> on, on every area, which is good to say. Um, so, yes, obviously looking at our main active areas at the moment, your neighbourhood we've, we've discussed at length today, uh, along with the waste collection and recycling. Um, I think one to pick up on is the members ICT steering group. We did actually have a meeting earlier this week and were pleased to find that there weren't any specific member issues at the moment with the, with the members ICT. Uh, so they all largely seem to have been resolved, which is good. Um, one of the things that we covered, and then there was a session for all members afterwards, was about the introduction of the new modern Gov process for how you're going to be able to see your reports in the future, how they get onto your apps and, and how they're published on the website. Had a bit of feedback that that was quite a complicated session and there seemed to be an awful lot of information, but reassurance, not to worry, there's going to be a lot of simplified information coming out and it is seeming to be a very good system. Um, Community safety and enforcement, we've obviously covered that today. Um, and then the asset and accommodation strategy, we haven't picked up today, but we have had two sessions since the last panel meeting. We had one back in uh, on the 25th of January and a previous one on the 2nd of December. So that's obviously going to stay very highly on the panel's work plan as that develops. Um, the session on the 11th of January for the Independent Office for Police Conduct was very well attended and had a lot of positive feedback about that, saying it was very interesting just to see how, you know, the police complaints were being responded to. And particularly they, they touched on what was going on in the local area and how it had been with all this this previous past year as well. So that was that was quite interesting. Um, I think the. Other one to pick up on is the budget scrutiny element. We had the budget scrutiny session for all members in December in advance of the budget setting in February, which was good. I know Councillor Bridger is very keen to work with finance officers that we actually make that now a much more forward thinking um, programme so that we're actually influencing the budget from a very early stage as opposed to sort of maybe looking at the last iteration before we have that agreement at Council. So that's the process that we're going to put into place uh, for members as well. Um, I don't think I have any other specific areas to pick up on other got, than the, the areas, sorry, Councillor Bridget, you picked up at the, the beginning part of the meeting about some references from Council around the um, police and crime panel, um, around Councillor Lane Morgan's observations with um, China and the supply chain, and then also additionally the community engagement and um, a, a strategy that we're looking at developing and how important and I think integral that's going to be to all of the panel's work. Thank you, Philippa. Yes, I was going to make, I, I think that, mm. yeah, with that consultation and engagement strategy, I know it's early days on that one, but um, I think we've already flagged to Councillor Holland and, uh, and Emma, Emma Diaku, that that scrutiny engagement with that particular strategy, I think, by its very nature, needs to be a bit different, perhaps with how we normally do things. It needs to be very early involvement, and we actually have some uh, members who have a lot of experience um, in that area. So and that's actually a big, big piece of, of work and fairly central again to how we deliver on the corporate plan. So that needs to go on there. Tied into that, I suppose, is actually the work that, um, which I think comes under the remit of of, uh, of this panel as well, will be Richard Blows's work, the developing work, the partnerships work, um, his, his new team, 
working with Emma. Um, again, that's, I think, again, closely aligned with the uh, consulta- consultation and engagement strategy, but also on those conversations that we've, that we've had or begun to have with um, town and parish councils on, on various things. So uh, that will come into play as well, I think. I think he's recently um, presented to uh, the corporate leadership team on that. Um, and I suppose the climate emergency action plan, Philippa, we, we obviously had a report in November. I think that's going to, as my understanding, that would be a six monthly update um, to to Coco, to, the, to this panel. So I, I guess we probably need a, a marker in there under the appropriate, the appropriate bit of the, of the work plan. Just to Sorry, remind us, really, that, that and, yeah, just as a reminder yeah. that we need to have a um, speak to Nikki and, and make sure that we get at least half year the updates uh, on on that. And again, the a bit that plan. I need to roll over as well on on the work plan is I know we've got the section where we look at what has been seen by the panel at the previous meeting, what's been seen by the panel at this meeting, and then that should actually be a rolling piece of work so we can actually be identifying what we're anticipating coming to panel at the next meeting as well. So yeah. I'll make sure that we keep that rolling for, for each yeah. panel. Thank you. And the, and, the, and finally, definitely the final piece is, is just read really update those panel members who aren't on the waste scrutiny steering group just really just report back on on what uh, those of us on that group have been doing a little bit so um i'm just as i know peter peter's on that on that group um as is john john Lay morgan uh we and, and robert so we've we've had uh, what are we up to now so meeting number 17 or 18 i think Thank since you, <laughs> since the council decision to um to set up the local authority trading company or um, North Somerset Environment Services as, as now is or will be on the 20 from the 27th of this month. So we've had um, well actually that th- those 17 meetings have just been the, the core group. We've actually had a number of break off sessions as well on, on uh, you know, as, as we've sort of dug a bit deeper on the different work streams. So we, we've covered a lot of ground, we've, we've um, which include off the top of my head, um, governance, which includes like the articles of association of the new company, which I think have been signed off or near to being signed off, the, the, the new governance structures, scrutiny engagement going forward, um, as we kind of will revert to our sort of usual, sort of business as usual type scrutiny role, I guess, once that's uh, the new company set up. We've had a lot um, of involvement with the recruitment in terms of the uh, of Brian Veal, the new our excellent MD um, of uh, the new company, oper- and then different streams on operations, um, HR. You know, two two being over the two hundred plus employees from from Biffa, the service level agreement. I know Councillor Cruz done a work on, a lot of work on that. Um, it's been good, and, the, and no red no red flags but you know some areas that uh i mean the whole thing actually the whole has been incredibly challenging and we've obviously had been able to influence it and had involvement in it but obviously it's been led by officers so i'd like to thank them enormously actually for everything they're doing to to, to deliver on that in, in such tight time scales so that that will form part of um the coco report to, to full council next month i've we've sent out a couple of fairly detailed updates to all members on, on what we've been doing in that group. I'm, I'm probably due to do another one, to be honest. But um, yes, for those of those members who've been involved with that process, um, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, are there any questions uh, on the work plan? Hugh. Hello. Yes. Um, the only thing was to say thank you very much for meeting with me and discussing the um, I think it, it was December full council. There was a discussion on the real living wage, yes. and it occurred to me that in North Somerset Council now, uh, as of February, in fact, uh, that's entirely a procurement problem. Um, so ethics in procurement. So perhaps it might make sense to combine Councillor Le Morgan's uh, thoughts on ethical considerations in procurement with the real living wage considerations and just turn that into one work stream might that make sense yeah i think i'll probably have to i mean i i mean thanks for mentioning it Hugh. so this is this is a case of 
ensuring that, as I understand it, that the that we pay people uh, a real the, living wage for yeah, procurement, the, basically. Um, yeah, through so through we do our partnerships. The council, not within the our contract, uh, all yeah, our contracts, so, though. Yeah, so partnerships like Alliance and and I get I guess you'd include the new um, environment, um, you know, some environment company in that too, just ensuring that. That, so that needs to be reviewed. I think, I mean, I, I see John shaking his head. So I think leave, leave that. Never with, mind. <laughs> yeah, leave, no, no. Thanks for flagging it, Hugh. We'll, we'll definitely look at that. And again, it's one of those things we'll just have to think, scratching my head, um, you know, how, how the best way of actually uh, investigating that and then making accordingly, you know, appropriate recommendations to, to whoever we need to make recommendations to. But so we'll take we'll take that away. Brilliant. I just um, wanted to make sure that wasn't lost because the leader said yeah, no. this was the appropriate panel to say that to. So that's all right. So thank you. Thank you for, for raising it. I, I can't see any more questions. So I don't think there's any other business. So at uh, quite a long one, not quite as long as Ash, though, uh, at uh, 4.35. I think um, thank you, everyone, for your participation. And I declare the meeting closed. Thank you.